Thank you for, for coming uh, and taking my team to Chicago for this little fusion from my face. Um, I'm Mario Tapia. I want to welcome everyone to um, Mobile Mondays. And tonight's session is a developer lab workshop. And we're going to focus on Amazon Web Services and a lot of the mobile services. We have um, uh, an evangelist from Seattle. And this will be a technical session, so it's also meant to be uh, engaging. So ask questions. So we have about three different demos that we'll go through. Um, Dennis, uh, who is presenting tonight. Um, and how many folks here write right code? How many guys are developers? Perfect. Um, how many people actually are practitioners working with Amazon Web Services and the app is awesome. Um, so uh, save your questions. And then, uh, yeah, just raise your hand, just like it's cool. Just raise your hand, hey, and then we'll ask questions and, uh, and, and see if we can stop Dennis. <laughs> so we'll put these in. Also, in the background, if you look at his uh, LinkedIn profile. Um, so, uh, so I'm Mario Tapia, and I've been we're getting together mobile developer groups for about 18 years now. So it started in Seattle in 1999. Um, it also started in, we, we became Mobile Monday in Seattle and started with in LA and then inherited a group in Silicon Valley and also lately in New York and then we worked with Twitter. Is that in the back? Say hi to Twitter. Hey, Twitter. Um, so Twitter is, uh, uh, he's based in Chicago and he's been running the meetings for quite a few years here now. Um, and I'm just uh, kind of a guest. Get that seat for the evening. Um, and uh, so yeah, so on a monthly basis, more more than once a month, we get together. Um, at a high level, I think there's about 140 cities that are pretty active around the world. So from Tokyo to Tel Aviv, um, folks are, are meeting just like uh, just like we are tonight. Um, so we have monthly meetups, and those are more panel discussions. We have uh, labs, which you're here at the lab, and we also do roundtable dinners. Um, how many people first time on Mobile Monday tonight? First time? Yeah, it's always like half, half. It's interesting. No matter what city I go to, it's like half of you. Okay, how many people found found us on Meetup? Meetup.com? How many people found the event right? That's right. How many people found from a friend? A friend told them. Cool. All right. Um, so uh, you can find us on Mobile Monday Chicago um, on Meetup. Um, these are all being recorded. So we have seven years of past history of different events, all different topics. So we are technology agnostic, because if we weren't focused on technology, we'd be still talking about Symbian and, and Blackberry. <laughs> but, uh, but things change. And so uh, with the times that change, we also change. Um, so you can find us on YouTube, and lots of different topics there. Um, and uh, specifically cloud and other developer platforms. Um, and then I'd like to say uh, thanks for Amazon Web Services. Give an applause, please. Yay! Thanks for being here. Um, also, the, the pizza, Twitter had a great suggestion by Giorno Pizza. It's not a plug for them, but it's really good. Yeah, oh my gosh. New York style pizza, Chicago. Well, who knew? So, um, stop with the video on here. Introduce Dennis, give him a round of applause. Thanks for coming out from all the way from Seattle. And, uh, thank you for coming out. Um, I'm excited to be here. This is a this is a cool opportunity. I didn't realize we were sponsoring it, but um, I guess that's how I got to talk then. I was paying for my way in on the stage. Um, so I did Mobile Monday in uh, Silicon Valley. It was really a lot of fun, and we uh, put together this slide kind of for uh, that audience in mind of like kind of a mix of the developers in different stages, enterprise, and many startups, and uh, depending on how involved you guys want to get. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, first talk about some of the serverless movement, uh, some of the cloud technology, not just with Amazon, but just with all the cloud providers. What it means is a mobile developer, how that shift is moving forward from like, you know, your, your bare metal to uh, virtual environments to now this uh, serverless microservices environment in the cloud. And then um, how, what that means for mobile developers, and then how AWS uses those mobile services. So even if you're not in a mobile project, web, whatever, if you're looking for a job, there's certain technology that um, a lot of hiring uh, companies are out there looking for, like Microsoft, Google, Amazon for one, 
um, even if it isn't, the AWS and Amazon.com is looking for cloud experience in a lot of those uh, resumes and experiences. So I'll talk about some of that technology because it'll be uh, the basis of how we're going to build things out today. And so if you have an idea of like what sort of if you're familiar with serverless, hopefully it'll just confirm everything that you're used to or have to use before. So, and then um, if you have any questions specifically, like there's no loss, raise your hand, I'll try to explain and uh, let's still try to move forward a little bit so we kind of, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's already a PDF, and um, at the end I'll give you the link to it so you can click on it and then um, contact me and, and links to the download, the source code for whatever project we need to So you'll have all that access. And then it's going to be recorded live, and then it'll be recording afterwards with the reader, so like that. So this is the agenda. Uh, we're talking about serverless for mobile, um, why, why, your, why it matters, uh, what, what to do with it, and then serverless on AWS for mobile specifically. And then we're going to build um, a mobile app on AWS. So we're going to take a lot of this as backend stuff. So if you haven't, aren't familiar with backend or somebody else says your backend, it's really good to understand some of the concepts behind the scene because we're not going to be decoding, we'll be configuring some of the backend services like API Gateway, some of the serverless uh, pieces and then building out a fully functional app so you can run it against um, the backend resources and play around with it, see how it works. So it's great for proof of concept, getting ideas, like you're working on a project, you want to en enable push notifications, you want to do storage, whatever it is, you can go in there and enable it and play with it and then work that into your own app. Um, so we're going to build that with uh, Mobile Hub, which is a service I'll talk about, how that integrates with all the AWS services. If, and uh, half of you, I think, are familiar with AWS and how mobile, uh, mobile Hub came about for mobile developers. And then um, once we build this app, we'll run it through and you'll be able to see the magic behind the scenes and take a look at it. And then we'll, um, we'll jump into some of the AI services because it's how it ties into some of the mobile with the three major ones, which is recognition, uh, image recognition, the chatbot piece, and then Poly, which is the text to, to speech, which just kind of ties into the mobile environment as well. And then we're going to take the, the mobile app that we built uh, at the beginning and we'll add that chatbot to it so we'll make it mobile. So we'll be able to like, Integrate it with Twilio. I want to send a text to it. Um, we'll use an example of um, Kelly Blue Book. They did a uh, chatbot POC that we worked on. We were on stage with them in San Francisco a couple weeks ago, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll build out like a sample environment there, building out the whole API all the way to the chatbot and integrate with with um, AWS. And then that should be it. And then if us, we have questions along the way, um, figure out 60 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever how long it takes us. <laughs> Okay, so this is how it all began. Back in the day, if anybody's familiar with servers, um, this was you co-located servers, you set up a server in a rack, or you had a home server, whatever it is. Set up your back end, simple web server, API server, whatever it might be, and it would just run. And then as things got uh, busy, you got a bunch of users, you would just go and add more drives, more CPU, more chassis, whatever it might be. You go to a co-location, maybe rent more servers, and obviously they didn't scale. There was, there was problems many times uh, over where you would either um, under-provision, so you would have issues where you wouldn't have enough servers, to, enough capacity, so you'd have to go in there and bring all these metal um, pieces in there and scale up. And then you would over-provision, so you create too many servers in there, and then you are paying for all these services, networks, everything else. A good example of it is um, NFL. NFL would have like racks and racks in Seattle. They had co-location. I used to work for uh, Ferio, and we hosted um, lots of servers for NFL. So they came in, and they would spend months and months setting up these servers, setting up for Super Bowl. And hundreds of engineers set up all these servers, and they had no idea whether the Super Bowl was going to be a hit or not. It could have been you know, two dead teams. could have been Chicago Bears. Who knows? Um, so they have the teams in there, and they're building up all these servers. And so over-provisioning, in most cases, they're spending millions of dollars over-provisioning all these servers when maybe the, the, the show wasn't that great. There was like maybe 8 million users or 8, 80 million, whatever it might be. And then at the, by the time the show's over, which is like basically two hours later after, everything just drops down for the whole season. And then all of a sudden they have all this hardware just staying by. They get to shut it down, they've already leased it. It's cost millions. And it wasn't, it was viable. It's like back in the day, that was the day when it was a million dollars to create a website for a million users, a million dollars for a million users. That's how much it costs because of this. So this is gone in, this is gone. Anybody who um, 
starting out a lot of boot camps, a lot of uh, startups are still using basic servers, you know, to get started in OJS, you have a one-on-one, -on -one, you have a, a hosting provider, you might go and remote into this or SSH, whatever it is, and, and use some of the virtual environments. But um, today, hopefully we're gonna talk about how the cloud is the new norm for development and setting up even the basic startup, starting out with the cloud, and then scaling into overnight millions of users. So that's the idea of like Tinder started with Amazon Web Services and then they continue to grow on Amazon Web Services with some of the technology that we're going to talk about. So maybe a little bit harder to get started like understanding, but if you understand that technology, it truly is. You set up the service, you set up the API, set up the security, and then your just users come in and you start paying the bills as you go and start. And then when they're not there, you're not paying much of any. So the idea is you're not over-provisioning and you're not under-provisioning. So a lot of things like Shark Tank is one of the big deals where they come in, mobile apps like uh, what was Ring or a couple of their services. If they didn't have their, their server set up the night before everything was going to happen, a lot of these services were just inundated and they lost that 24-hour window of opportunity where somebody was trying to uh, want, look at their services, look at videos, whatever it might be. They didn't have the capacity, kind of like Oprah effect. If those back in the day when Oprah would say, oh, I love these items and that person wasn't warned, they weren't ready for it. Whereas here, we create these mobile apps, we have no idea how popular it's gonna be. So the idea is getting them into this virtual environment. So this is the server piece. And the serverless, is anybody familiar with the serverless um, with any of the other cloud providers where we're not necessarily talking about serverless, but to you guys, it looks like serverless. We're talking about breaking out pieces of code from the servers that you're used to running like Apache and Node. You're taking those functions out you know, like one that made a thumbnail, right? Somebody uploaded an image and you made a thumbnail out of it. That was the specific amount of code that you now put into individual functions. We call them Lambda functions, we call them Azure functions, whatever it might be. So they're running on something like this behind the scenes, but the cloud provider is doing all the scaling for you. So if everybody's familiar with the virtual environment, like EC2, you set up a server, you have it running constantly, and then you, have, you can scale it, it would scale up and down and that kind of thing. So that was before servos, so you could kind of have that nice growth pattern where servers could um, launch and then they could decrease, they could deprovision as you needed, and then you could pay for as you go. And those were actually running on real servers. Now this, with the serverless piece, the code is running on these servers still, but you're just worried about the code. You're not worried about any patchy configuration, you're not worried about memory, CPU, anything. You're just worried about that code running. So you put a piece of code in there, say I want to make a thumbnail out of this, you upload the code, you're paying nothing until somebody uses it. And so you get a free tier, let's say it's like a, a million requests per, uh, per month. And so you set up this code, and every time somebody uploads an image, you make a thumbnail and send them back that thumbnail. And so you're only paying for when they use it, and then you pay for storage as they drop in those images. And then over the weekend or nights, whatever, there's no server running, it's just standing by. So launching in milliseconds, and then launching, setting up this <clears throat> ephemeral storage, and then it'll shut down. So these, we're talking like set up like uh, container services where the service will launch within milliseconds as if you were already running, and then it'll do its thing and then shut down. So think about any of the RESTful APIs that you call, any sessionless uh, environments, whatever it might be, those are running in Lambda functions. And we'll go through kind of so it makes a little bit more sense. Is anybody using Lambda right now, or Azure Functions, or in Firewall, okay. yeah. on a regular basis? Yeah, yeah, uh, actually I have a question for you. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is that when you set up a Lambda function, you have to assign a certain uh, number of memory. I know you have to set the memory, otherwise uh, it doesn't work any other way. You have to set a specific number of megabytes that you want to assign to the, to the Lambda function. And that sort of contradicts the way it should be without you know, getting worried about how much uh, um, memory and CPU you are assigning to that Lambda function. Because the other thing that they don't tell you about this, this small letter you know, that you have to read uh, is that uh, the CPU assigned to that function is a function of how much memory you assign to the function. Right. You know, yeah. So he's talking about there's some configuration pieces in there that yeah. take a little bit of testing trying to figure out. But really it's kind of at a base so because behind the scenes they're all real servers. Yeah. So they kind of have to give you a base of like how much uh, you're going to utilize and then in the future there's going to be some AI in there involved, right? There's going to be some automatic, like, out of how many, one million API calls, most of them only use about this much CPU. So if you have this consistent pattern, then we'll continue to use that same, that same base. But the idea is try to set up a base, sort of like some of the services you might set up. Otherwise, like, okay, it's going to be about this request rate and then scale from there. 
So yeah, there's a little bit of a configuration there, but it's sort of set up a base. It'll still work, yeah, and then there's, there's a, a tie-in with the CPU in there to help. You have to take more memory, which means more CPU. So I can go into a little bit about that, but I just want to talk about more of the, just the general idea of the, of the LAMP function, just so everybody doesn't get lost. So some of these, um, no service supervision or manage, um, scales with usage, so these, um, and bear with me, this doesn't make sense yet, because if you haven't used uh, the service piece, it doesn't make sense what we're talking about, but then you go back to that server piece where you're, you know, the you know, hot swapping, changing drives, changing hardware, whatever it is. So no service supervision or manage, so basically you're running code, and everything's done behind the scenes, scale with usage, and then um, never pay for IO. So that's the idea. So it doesn't cover all the use cases, but it covers a good 90, 95% of the, the cases, especially for mobile. This is important for mobile because when they set up mobile and you're, you're released this app, you've got it on the app store, you know, let's say it takes a week for it to get ready to go, you're not having all these servers set up ready to go and standing by. You just kind of pay as you go, you get to have it set up just with your code and then it just runs. So you don't have to like really tweak it much at all and then it'll just run overnight. And then availability faults are all like built in. So this is another thing with, with some of the EC2, some of the virtual environments, you have set up certain um, availability zones, which is one of those logical uh, data centers within a region. And then when you're EC2, you have to kind of specify some kind of script and, and, and do a little bit more work. It would still scale the same way, but now this does it done automatically. So if there's a one logical data center that's having issues behind the scenes, it just automatically routes. And you shouldn't even have to notice uh, anything. So this is better visual. I like to see the visuals so you can see. So we talk about the serverless piece. I want to talk about three main core pieces, and this, this we're going to go into actually name of AWS pieces. But um, one of them is Cognito. So Cognito was, does the authentication and authorization to API Gateway and Lambda. So Lambda was what we just talked about. Lambda is the, the heart of it, the, the business logic. And then we throw in this API Gateway, which is sets up a RESTful endpoint. So think about um, building out this API from the beginning, before any of the user interface, before anything, set up an API. And this is kind of your RESTful endpoint to say, allow a user to come in here, and then you can route traffic to them. You can throttle them, you can rate limit them, you can um, charge for it, so you can actually build some of your users for it. To give you an example, like um, W Underground is you know, a web API. And they can they create an app, they can make money on their ads, but they can also resell that API. So they would use something really similar to this. They would take an API gateway and then add each individual developer out there that wants to build a weather app. 10 requests per second, I'll charge you 10, 20 bucks. You want you know more enterprisey, I'll give you five day forecast for hundred dollars a month, resell right there, you get a key and you access my API. So I'm a mobile app developer and I create this back end, I got all this stuff. So the idea is I'm calling the same API and then I'm also reselling that API if it's useful to other developers. So think about that behind the scenes when you have this great API, you have, oh wait, I could be making more money off of other developers that are using the app and then I can make money off of my app. So the idea is here, this allows you to do that, allows you to keep those isolated users and rate them and throttle them and do whatever you want with them. And then you have the protection of the built-in firewalls as well. So you can protect it from like certain regions or whatever it might be. And then once it goes back, you can go into one or many Lambda functions depending on your use case. And we'll go through a few of those. So Lambda, once it's running, it can call any of the other uh, Amazon Web Services or any of your, if you want to go back to one of your colo servers or you have one of your SAP applications, whatever it is, it would go here. And then you can connect the VPN and, um, or VPC into here if you want to. So this would be, the users would be there. Um, the nice thing about uh, Cognito is it provides two things. It allows anonymous users to use your app, but then also they're given this uh, temporary credentials to access your resources. So think about most most of the developers. I'm guessing they're probably still using API keys, and then you have a, you know a developer API key. We put it in the app, we develop, we build it, and then release it in the app store. But that key is important, right? If that key gets stolen or gets compromised, that has access to everything. So the idea is you don't put any keys in there. Each user either signs up with username, and password, Facebook, um, you know, um, with uh, Google, whatever it might be, and then they get these limited credentials that can access here. So they don't sign into anything, they still get credentials, but then they get to here, you can say, okay, are they anonymous, what are they logged into, and then I can give them specific access. Like I could say, all right, we're gonna allow you to upload five images and make five thumbnails, and you're done. After that, you gotta log in or make an in-app purchase. And then from there, it kind of goes, it goes um, into uh, these other services. 
And so this whole piece is serverless. So there's no servers running. It's like, oh, server's not running, script's not running, Apache's dead, whatever it is, no configs. You just kind of let it run. So we say that. And we're, that's what we're going to build with Mobile Hub. We're going to build an API of like a vehicle value. We'll build up this API, and then we'll put the Lambda function in the back. So when we call it, it comes through, it does the whole cycle, the HTTP, Git, post, whatever it might be. And then these guys can be, uh, Lambda can actually trigger any of these, like the store data, usually what images they've uploaded, uh, push notifications, and then S3 is our cloud storage, really cheap cloud storage. You can store those, the original objects, the thumbnails, and then go that way. And then um, another good example is, uh, we'll, we'll demonstrate one of the um, anonymous pieces where a user will not log in, a user app, they go in, they can upload an image from their phone, they go ahead and land it, okay, great, and they create a public folder. So any user who hasn't logged in can access a public folder. This is gonna give you just an example and an example out. We can access to that public folder, and that's all you can do. And there's a private folder there, but you can't access it until you actually log in, so we know who you are. So when they log in, then they can access that same public folder or a private folder. So you just create like this Dropbox environment for that user. So it's nice to show that back and forth, like that best practice pattern all the way from users logging in to um, using the core API. So I'm going to talk about Cognito, which is the off piece, API Gateway, and Lambda. Those are the three big ones right now that we're uh, talking about with mobile developers and getting started in any kind of new app or existing app. Just get this set up and then get running and then um, it's, it doesn't matter whether you're running cross-platform, a website, a mobile development, you've got this API and you have a set and you just use that one endpoint. <coughs> any questions about that? We'll probably get into more, but and that should be a little more clear. Okay, so this is these are the pieces. So we talked about the serverless piece. These are Lambda function, API gateway, and then the other cloud providers have their other names, but basically the same idea as having that API, and then the Lambda function is that serverless microservices that you're built by short little burst of information, and then it just scales, um, scales based on your need. Okay, so mobile developers. This is some of the pieces that we cover uh, with the authorizations. We talked about Cognito, server-side logic. We're going to build an L Lambda API gateway, which is we call the cloud logic, which is that, that piece. So remember, these are the core. And then everything else is kind of uh, nice where you can sync um, users like iCloud. You see two users that have uh, logged in, and then you're from Facebook, you log into your iPad. You can sync those, pri those private images and sync that information. And then two really important pieces. Analytics, it's another reason why um, a lot of users will go to the cloud because of the, all the big data, all the stuff is sending in all this raw data, whether you're not ready for it or not. Set up analytics as much as you can, set up and just forget about it if you can. You know, aggregate some of that data, but the idea is to set up because it's so cheap to store millions of calls and then decide what you want to do with it later. But if you don't have it, then you can't really do much with those users. So we'll talk about like, you know, 25% of the uh, users drop off after the first launch of the app, right? So that's kind of a common deal. Like, how do you understand what those users are? If you don't understand where they're coming from, if there were any crashes, what devices they're on, without Android, without iOS, what are the issues that they're having before they leave? And so, if you don't have any of that retention stuff, you can't understand it, you won't be able to notify those users. So, like, with, um, a, one good example of this is when iOS uh, 10 came out and there was like a big permissions issue, a lot of existing apps didn't have it. Um, and there was just all these crashing. If you had crash reporting, you might be able to figure it out. But it just turned out to be existing apps. Maybe Apple didn't tell us enough information, but um, if the user tried to access their photo albums and we didn't get permissions or we didn't ask for permissions, the app just crashed. That was it, when iOS 10 came out. And so one of those things that you could tell, like you all of a sudden you're seeing this drop off, if you have analytics, you could immediately be able to pinpoint those users and say, Okay, 10% of my users I can, I can pinpoint and send a push notification to all my iOS 10 users who have crashed in the last two weeks or whatever, and just notify them and say, hey, we understand the problem, we're working on it. You know, versus like just, it's dead. And where are they gonna go? They're gonna go to the App Store and give you a bad rating. So the idea is to understand who they are, where they're coming from, and then, because you don't want to send it out to the Android folks, they don't care. So you want to be able to sit, pinpoint those specific users to let them know, hey, iOS 10 users, they're gonna love it. They're gonna be like, okay, this is great. I mean, not great, but they're going to at least know that the developers are working on it. That's important. Communication. Um, Amazon S3 is the storage. This is not specific for mobile, but it's a lot of mobile developers use it. You could use the, the SDK where we allow transfer utility of all the objects into S3 and just store it for your users. Or 
if you want to deliver it through CloudFront, this is the CDN environment. So let's say you have an app that has um, delivers a lot of like static images, a lot of videos. You would use CloudFront on top of S3. I won't go into this too much detail, but after if anybody has any streaming video audio stuff that they want to talk about, um, come talk to me because I, I have the picture and I have a few blogs that you can refer to that talks heavily about Amazon S3 and then you front with cloud front with those edge points. So if you have customers in India or in different countries, they can hit those edge points with that cache data and get really low latency for those videos. And then we have a service that actually can turn like certain MP4s into HLS so you can start streaming those right away from that mobile device so that you pick up 300K, 400K, uh, a meg if you're in the city or whatever, so it automatically adjusts for those videos and all serve from the cloud front instead of going to one location. Okay, push notifications, um, important. 50%, 52% of the users um, will accept push notifications, so you may lose some of those, but push notifications are important because that piece, right, if you're tracking anything from ads um, for, uh, you want to give them an boy, whatever it is, they uh, reach a certain level, you want to give them tokens, any way that you can reach them, if you don't have their email address or you have an SMS, whatever, really important to set up uh, push notifications. And then iOS, you can use it to track uh, who's installing your app. I don't know if that's, if anybody know that secret. That's why you enable push notifications, even if you're not going to use it. One of the big tricks is understanding iOS users who've dropped off, because you never know who's deleted the app, right? So you have a million downloads, you know who's active, but you don't know who actually had deleted the app. So we had, there's a trick, so we the trade of uh, using push notifications to see those stale tokens. So you can immediately just say, oh, I see how many people have actually deleted the app. Um, so it's really important to kind of understand, because you can look at that, track it with this, push notifications, and there's also pieces where you can do side push. So you can update your app and do certain things that make it a lot easier for a user, like the weather app on, on Apple is constantly being updated behind the scenes. Is that good or bad? You know, because it's using a network, it's trying to make the best uh, access to Wi-Fi, but when you go to access that weather, it's already there. Everything, all the news sites, everything can, are they're using push notifications so that when you go to access that app, you're not waiting that two, three seconds when you're on the bus or the train waiting for that news article to load. It's already there. So a lot of that has to do with push notifications because you can notify the app, wake it up, and then go download that content and have it ready. And again, you can go back to Pinpoint and analytics and store and understand those user base so we can start putting AI into it, right? And say like, these users, down, opens the app every every day at eight o'clock, you know, so you can kind of just really narrow it down so that you can catch them in that moment where maybe they're on Wi-Fi for like five minutes at Starbucks every day and you could actually actually pinpoint it so that you're making good use of that, uh, that Wi-Fi and then downloading that data. So it kind of ties in together. Data storage, um, Amazon DynamoDB is our NoSQL solution for storing anything like the data objects, the user objects, whatever it might be, uh, session state. Uh, and then the conversation uh, box we'll talk about in a little bit where uh, we're talking about Amazon Lex, which is the chatbot piece where we can take a mobile. So it takes Alexa, which is, you know, stationary echo and, and show and all that, and we can put it in our app. So, and the way I'm, I'm explaining it uh, is when we went back to the API, we, we talked about like making a rest restful command, you know, get post, whatever it might be and you just click a button or you type in something. The idea is really we're just making a new interface for it. So Lexus allowed us to do that, to take this natural language or take this text and make those same commands. So if somebody were to like um, upload a picture and make a thumbnail, they could say, take a picture and send me a thumbnail, whatever it might be, or send me the water note. So they could automatically just talk to their app and then interact with it through a voice, whatever it might be. And we have some examples that allow users to uh, schedule um, a car, or they could uh, uh, reserve a hotel, whatever it might be. There's examples of it going through the whole cycle. And I'll, I'll um, go through one of those so we can build a um, vehicle value. So, talk about all these pieces, and then now Mobile Hub. So Mobile Hub is the heart. So as a mobile developer, if you guys, you can follow along too when I go through the demo. Um, mobile developer, have come to the site, the Amazon Web Services, they come there, there's well over 70 plus services, and they're not specific to mobile. So we've got a lot of feedback and we've launched this a little two years ago, and we created this mobile hub, which is an aggregator of a lot of AWS services that we just talked about back here, that are common for mobile developers, not necessarily directly for mobile developers, like S3 isn't, 
Um, but a lot of the commonalities, these features that uh, are common for mobile developers to uh, add to their uh, applications. And we put them in a mobile hub and migrate all the services. And we put them in there as these features. Instead of like saying, oh, I need to learn about Cognito or I need to know what S3 is. I don't care what S3 is. I don't really understand it yet because you're getting started. You're like, I need storage. I need my users to log in with username and password. I need whatever it is. So we created these little feature cards like user sign-in. It's like, okay, you want username and password, set it up. You want MFA, so you can do that as well. And this service is uh, behind the scenes powered by Cognito. So the idea is to get these features that you want into the mobile app and then understand like, oh, that's Cognito, okay, behind the scenes. So you don't have to go to Cognito, learn everything about Cognito and how the uh, uh, authorization works and everything. You click on here, there's instructions, talks about costs, and everything, how things might be set up. I'll, I'll walk through that. And then NoSQL, you can set up, instead of going to DynamoDB, you can set up, set up some tables, set up permissions to do that so you have like a private or public uh, read-only type table that only allowed access for those users. Everything's kind of tied in. Uh, and then the flawed logic piece we talked about, which is the API gateway and Lambda. So by default, there's already best practices. We always set up every app starts with Cognito, whether it's anonymous or, or login. And then it ties in with the API gateway Lambda function. So we create this, this base API that just goes and calls Lambda, and then Lambda spits back a bunch of HTTP code, and it says, okay, here you go. So it's a starter base. It's a Node.js in the back end, which is running the Lambda function. So user data storage is another example. So we want user data storage. We talk about like Dropbox or whatever it might be. And so this behind the scenes uses Cognito, um, of course, and S3. So just by clicking on enable, it's going to create an S3 bucket. If anybody's creating an S3 and you don't have to move console, it'll create this S3 bucket and it'll automatically have the privileges and allowing these users to log in. So it'll create that public-private folder I talked about, for example. And so if they're not logged in, they can upload images to that public folder within this uh, bucket. Or if they've logged in with Cognito or with the, uh, Facebook or a username and password, then they can access that private folder within that bucket we just created. Okay, so conversational bots we'll get to after because we'll come back. And basically, we build the bot and then we can just incorporate it. So what it's doing, is the bot's already created, we can already interact with the bot through the console of, the, of Amazon Lex. But the nice thing is this ties in again with this user, so you can allow the user to interact with the bot or limit access to that user. Maybe they can chat, but they can't talk. Um, and the other thing it does is creates this the sample app where it gives you that text, you know, the bubble, like who's talking, and then the, here comes the robot. It has the beat built-in uh, permissions for the microphone, so it launches the app. So you can immediately get started and start talking to your bot in your mobile app, and then you can go and integrate that with your own. <coughs> Messaging and analytics, this is the one we talk about pinpoint. So you enable analytics, by default, it'll throw in the analytics SDK, and it'll automatically, right when you launch the sample app or your own app, if you have it integrated, it'll automatically start collecting demographics. Everything from like you know, iOS, OS, device, um, carrier, whatever you might be, whatever is interesting. And then it also starts tracking session data, so that's really important, so how long, the sessions were open, meaning like how often the screens, what screens were being used, all those are by default, you don't have to do anything. And then there's an example in there of doing custom data. So like if you have a game, you can start tracking right away, like say if the user reaches level three, and then you can start saying, okay, level three was reached, and so you'd be able to track those and aggregate that data and say 5% of your users were reaching level three on X date. Or again, if you wanted to pinpoint them, you could say every, you know, for every month, Everybody who's re reached uh, level three within three weeks, we send them a code or something like that. Or hey, if you share this now with 10 of your friends, we'll give you an extra $10 bonus or something like that. So see how this kind of tied into the engagement and retention and, and keeping them around. If you collect that data, that's really important. And again, look if you, this is a separate pricing and you're using Amazon Pinpoint, it's just collecting analytics. So you're paying like, um, for 1 million calls, I think it's the first million calls are free and then you pay like, uh, 99 cents for the next million calls. So think about all those. Are, you know, so if you have a million users, you have one call a day, whatever it might be. So it could add up once you have a million users, but the idea is like it would ramp up really slow and you'd be able to collect a lot of data for a really low price. Hosting and streaming is another uh, feature that we just uh, enabled, enhanced, is where it utilizes, remember we talked about that S3, some of you might be interested in the S3 cloud front. It uh, enables that, so it enables the hosting and streaming. So a lot of the users we found out that are using S3 as a uh, web host, and so they're paying, like, let's say, a dollar a month for hosting their server, and that's serverless because 
There's just throwing an HTML file in there, S3 bucket, and then starting your website. And if you front it with CloudFront, remember we talked about, it would go back to the S3 bucket at the time, but if you use CloudFront, it would front it with any of those images, those static images or videos in the different regions, depending on where your users are coming from. Yeah? Uh, how does the pinpoint, I mean, the chatbot and the pinpoint, so does the pinpoint have the access to the text in the chatbot, or is the chatbot very secure? So, or, or the Amazon Lex? So you're talking about the, the chatbot when you integrate it? Is it yeah, the Lex and the pinpoint, so does the text or the information that the customer or the users share in the Lex, Amazon Lex, it does it feed into the pinpoint? No, not by default. That would be a custom event. So by default, it probably creates a session. It would know how many people are actually chatting mm -hmm. by default, and then how long those chat sessions were open. But it wouldn't say, oh, Johnny said something really bad. Mm -hmm. you know, And for how long did he say it was bad? And how old was he? It doesn't say anything like that. Okay. But you could. You could track that custom event. You could just say, because you'll know if they logged in, user ID, you could say user ID has spent more than five hours a day on the app chatting with Amazon Lex with somebody. You could go as deep as you want, but by default, it's just going to track and say, all right, we got like 5,000 people on an active daily basis talking in the session with, with a bot, whatever it might be. So you can, and then you can custom that. Okay, so hosting, that's just all it is. It sets up an S3 bucket for hosting and uh, CloudFront for the distribution if you want that. And then uh, connectors is a piece that were, uh, we actually just deprecated. It was uh, for the enterprise, it was connecting in that Lambda piece into SaaS providers or Marketo or something else, which uh, wasn't um, as, as popular. So we, we, we kind of regrouped and, and focused on other pieces like that. So if you want to talk about that, we can, we can go that route. But if you go back to that core API, that's really where it is, is setting the core API. And then from Lambda, you can go anywhere you want. So you've got that Lambda function. You can set up a VPC and go into all your private stuff, the banking data, whatever it is. Or you can go into other AWS services or you can go into another VPN if you wanted to outside and connect into any or other data if you want. So it's really just, it's open that way. Okay, so now we're gonna go through a demo. I'm gonna run through uh, what it's like to run through the mobile hub services. We'll create a, uh, enable a few of those features so you can kind of see what those, uh, what those features look like. Any questions why I got set up? <coughs> Anybody not have an Amazon? Yeah. Maybe why you might ask you to uh, compare AWS to the Azure. And you care. What other features? Yeah. <laughs> and Google, you know, you just do it in. Uh, I could do it offline. I'd rather not talk about some of the, oh. the benefits, but there's, yeah, there's benefits across both. But I, I'm not an expert on Azure, so I'd be, I would be maybe tilted more one way because um, I started. My history with Amazon, I started before I even started with Amazon Web Services. That's why I kind of got the job. Is I created a mobile app uh, for the Olympics back in the day. And I had set up an EC2 service and push notifications and everything. And um, I had no idea it was going to do well or not. And so I set it up and it was, I got rejected three or four times because of issues with trademarks and everything else. So I set up an EC2 server connected to, to an API that was uh, in Denmark and paid, paid a lot of money for this API to you know, stream data every five seconds. Everything from like some guy broke his leg to some guy got drunk, somebody didn't show up to the race, whatever it is. But the idea of the app was real-time push notifications for podium events. So anytime a country or a athlete won gold, silver, or bronze and somebody, one of you, would subscribe to that country or that sport, it would send a notification. So um, they could subscribe, download the app, and they could subscribe to all these events real-time. So as soon as they drop that, cross that, uh, that blue tape, within maybe 15 seconds to calculate the data, they would automatically send it out to all those users who subscribe to that event or that, that country. And, and it just scaled, and all of a sudden I just like had users uh, launching the app, and it was, I think there was like 42,000 people active, right? But when I sent a push notification, a lot of them had like track and field, and there was like, uh, remember you said Bolt when he won the world record, it was like everybody was subscribed to track and field or their country or whatever it might be. And then he won the world record and I sent a notification out and it's like 30,000 people launched the app at once. So it's like 30,000 requests per second is a lot. And you can't scale that fast if you're like, oh, and it comes in big ways. So it just like, just hits you hard, comes in, you can see the API calls just like go down overnight, six hours of nothing, and then just spike right back up and then nothing. So that was where I fell in love with cloud. I was like, wow, I couldn't even imagine. And everything just went seamless. I was like, oh. I, so I never got called, no one called me, I was just like, it just, it just worked. And then I got this big bill from um, 
uh, urban airship. I was using push notification. Anybody can go to urban airship. Ridiculous. I sent millions of push notifications, and it's cost me like 450 bucks. And today, on Amazon, it cost you like 49, 50 cents, I think, about equivalent. So that, I mean, obviously, that was a few years later, but that's how the how, how the cost has dropped down dramatically. I mean, for for a developer, 450 dollars a month is a lot for just push notifications. Imagine what everything else. And uh, I had that one server that was able to like, hold on. But um, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, since all the mobile hub is integrated, like the uh, from the Cognitor to S3 to Lex and Bitcoin, <coughs> and you also mentioned about the enterprise data connectors. So when the enterprise system doesn't use the Cognitor or anything, it just comes to the API. How does the every other thing synchronize us? So would be just not using Cognito, use your own like SAS yeah, the SAS and SAS and, and, app, and then it's through the connector and comes to the API to fetch the data and the process to just the legs. Yeah, I mean, the, I didn't mention SAML. There's, there's one of the enterprise connectors, so you can do SAML and then connect it into um, the API gateway Lambda. So they can, they can bypass the API gateway, they go straight to Lambda if they want. But what the enterprises would do, they would have the Lambda function here inside the VPC. And then inside the VPC is all their private data, all the stuff they would have, like a SQL Server, Enterprise, SaaS, whatever it might be, they would connect in there. So it depends on how you want to authenticate those users through SAML, through um, um, single sign-on, whatever it might be, you can have that and give them credentials. So you can give them a username password or the key and secret if you wanted to, or that's why a lot of them will implement the API gateway so they can give them a key specific for that, for that company. So let's say you're an enterprise that is reselling to hundreds or thousands of businesses, you give them that API key and they, you can watch them and, and throttle that and, and, and build it based on that usage. So the pinpoints and every other thing doesn't care whether it's from incognito or SAML as long as the user is connected. So the data is all synchronized. Right. Yeah. A lot of the, a lot of pinpoints are anonymous anyway. So it's like just collecting, like you said, unless you're collecting who Johnny is talking to, you're just kind of collecting a, a generic term. So you're really just kind of usually they let that wide open. You just like collect the data. So as soon as somebody opens the app, there's really not a lot of authentication going on. Permission you just send it out anonymously. But yeah, they can tie in with the VPC mostly. Yeah. A uh, question on using the uh, SNS versus just directly using sending it to the Google or the GCM or uh, the Apple push notification. What's the benefit? So the benefit is overhead. I mean, we have a lot of. If anybody set. Yeah. Oh, so you talking about why SNS is one of the push providers? So what SNS does is an intermediate between Apple and GCM for push notifications. So traditional push notifications to the different platforms. And so SNS is a middleman, kind of like uh, Urban Airship and some of the other providers. And what we do is we say, hey, give me your developer key, and then we'll send those push notifications on your app. So uh, several reasons, um, especially for Apple, is the managing keys is really, really important. Apple will just shut it down. They won't even ask questions. And what I mean is by if you start sending push notifications to an app that's been deleted, you remember, you, you don't know if an app's been deleted. Nobody knows if an Apple app has been deleted. So you send a push notification to it multiple times, Apple will shut that down. So your responsibility is to make sure on a daily or hourly basis that to decommission those tokens when those apps are deleted. So that's one of the big ones right there. That's a lot of overhead. So big customers will come to us and say, you know, they have big teams, dedicated teams for this, and they say, I don't want to manage it anymore. So the costs are so low, just let us take care of it, and then you can scale. And then what also we've done is we've taken that to, to scale is you're responsible for sending like a million and, and iterating through those millions, right? So now you can set up those million users ahead of time, subscribe them to a specific topic or whatever it might be, like NFL. And then you just say push notification <laughs> to NFL users, subscribers, and then it just goes. Within a, you know one minute or 30 seconds, so all million users will have a push notification. If you use one of the other providers, then you have to go directly to them, have a dedicated server, and connect to them. And again, with Apple, you have to have the dedicated HTTPS and um, <laughs> HTTP2 connection. So you have to constantly monitor that connection. And it's a lot of resources, both uh, uh, manpower and physical and, and devices, servers, to keep those connections open for that real time, especially like Void, if you start iterating with that stuff. And as soon as we keep track of the devices getting deleted, you know, the app yes. or the app yeah. getting deleted yeah. from the device. Okay. Yeah. So he's talking about like, so the, the feedback, feedback service is what it's called with the different providers. And then every day we work with a feedback service and say, okay, these 10,000 tokens have been uh, removed or whatever it might be. So you can just see 
um, your user base. And that's how you can kind of track who's active. You can set a push notification five times a day to the same person, you can set it silently and then figure out eventually that if that, that token goes bad, then you know that device is pretty much deleted or there's been a new replacement token. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, so there's the, the big, um, yeah, nobody should be doing their own push notification unless maybe it's Facebook or something you know, where they need full control of that. I mean, any, even large enterprises will probably go through a third party provider. Well, you know there's a difference with FCM, the Firebase? With what? The Google GCM launched Firebase. So now, yeah, FCM is GCM, so we integrate with FCM now. Yeah, which is basically the same engine. So yeah, it's kind of weird because you have to go to Firebase create the account and then send us the credentials and, and you can use Firebase if you want. But the idea is like nice to be able to do the cross platform, which they offer as well. So you just figure out what price, what scale, and how they do it. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, oh man. Okay, so remember we are talking about some of the, the services with Mobile Hub where users would come in the console. So this is the default console. Anybody used uh, Amazon Web Services, this is like everything out of the time. They go in there and have this nice, this actually works pretty well when you type in a service, a service that you you're know you're gonna use, like S3 or something like that. But in our case, we're gonna use Mobile Hub, which is where I always suggest that if you're just kind of like, remember Mobile Hub, and it'll kind of get you started in some of those, uh, those pieces. So it's project-based. So I have all these other projects that I've created. Um, and then the project doesn't cost you, so Mobile Hub is a free service. Remember, it's an aggregate of all the other services. So the cost, and I get this question every time, is uh, what's the cost? And the cost is based on what resources you configure within those projects. So if I configure S3, it's hard to say, oh, it's gonna cost you $1.29 a month. I have no idea, because based on how many objects you upload, and transfer rate, how big they are, whatever it might be. So each individual service has their own feature, and I keep talking about like this million, because a lot of them have like Lambda have a million free API calls, API gateway, all that. So kind of take a look at it. But it's not gonna, you're not gonna set up this app and then all of a sudden tomorrow get a $50 bill at all. You'll know because you'll be using it, and then you kind of keep track on a daily basis if you want. But in theory, if you set up just a regular chat app, you're doing some stuff, hang on, you're gonna be a few dollars every week if you time send thousands of calls. So just keep an eye on that and um, if that's a problem, then you kind of like look at some of the resources because everything's spread out. Say, like, all right, here's all my costs in S3. Everybody seen Silicon Valley? The show where the AWS bills out of control and they can't afford it. So they've reached a certain level now. AWS bills are out of control because they have all these users, but they don't they don't have any money to pay the bill. But um, but you can watch that bill and, and grow. And it's not usually a problem unless you're running some like service that's running out of control. And again, back that was back in the day when you had a big EC2 service running. And you're like, oh, I didn't realize I had this. Uh, developer EC2 running with like uh, 400 gigs of RAM and you know all the CPU and then it's just sitting there and it's like costing you two bucks a minute and uh, so that's usually what happens with, with these builds but in this case everything usually is pretty controlled and you can run through and, and there's some sample uh, demos where we have a chat app that um, talks about the price and you generalize like how many calls it might be and what it might cost if you set it up. So we go in here and create a new project and you can choose the, the region if you want. By default, it's uh, the US East region. And then we'll call this um, Mobile Monday. And this is cost us $2. <laughs> All right, so here, and um, you saw the, the other checkbox in some of these. So once we enable it, we'll see a little checkbox and we'll know kind of where we are. So we're going to build this, this is building our backend, we're going to provision all these services. So instead of going into all these other services like S3, creating the bucket, and then going to IM, which nobody asked me about IM until the end of this, but um, IM is one of the, the pieces we're cognitizing, right? This is the IM rules that um, allows them to authenticate and authorize those users to do certain things with your resources. So by default, this is going to call all tie into those uh, resources. So it's like in <clears throat> configuring all these uh, services outside of their own console. And then when you want to be more advanced, like you want to mess with the uh, database the table or mess with the Lambda function and update the code or then you go to the Lambda function. And then when we're done, <clears throat> you'll see resources and you'll link to everything like, oh wait, it's Lambda, okay. And you click on the Lambda function, it should take you right into the editor to take a look at it. You look at a CPU, you can look at whatever the default settings are for, for that. And then same thing with user storage, it'll take you to the S3 bucket that we created for you. You can see the different values in there. 
and then we upload a sample image for you as well. And then conversational bots, this is just basically the integration. We're going to build it outside because we don't have the tool to build the whole, all the, the intents and everything else. And then we integrate that with uh, an existing bot. And then um, the same thing, we're just, a lot of them are just click and go. Just like click, and behind the scenes, this is going to enable um, the analytics piece, which is the pinpoint. And then it's automatically going to get the SDK ready. So when we're we configuring these services, then we'll go to anybody. And the cool thing about Mobile Hub is this integrates with the native uh, Android or an iOS Objective-C or Swift app. So you'll be able to download the app, launch it, say, okay, great, and interact with you know a, an app that we've created that you know an engineer built. But it's it's the idea is to be able to interact with those um, services that we have enabled. So you can like you push, you can upload photos, you can do analytics, uh, whatever it might be, and then. Next to it, there's instructions on saying, okay, I got my weather app, I got my other app ready to go, and I'm going to codify it. Follow those instructions, and you can take each one of those pieces out and then build it. Because we, uh, the power of that sample app is, is really important because a lot of users will get stuck in some of those pieces, like you talk about, like, where you build a S3 bucket, and it's like, all right, so people start throwing stuff in, and you don't realize like there's access lists. There's, there's the great thing about Amazon Web Services, you can have really good fine grained control over a lot of stuff. Security is number one. So important. But by default, when you're setting up and you're mobile developer, you just want to look. A lot of people just set things up and open the whole bucket up and say, let's just test it and then we'll lock it down later. Which is kind of like an old Windows box, right? Wide open and you lock it down later. So the intent here is just to have this best practices is create this whole flow so you're not putting in these bad keys and, and uh, uh, keys with root access or anything else. So you're kind of setting up this best practice. Because in theory, when we set up these resources, it's important to know is we set up this API, we set up this web, um, this mobile app, and you integrate with your own. Literally tomorrow, you could have a million users, and it would not make a difference to this. You're not migrating anything, you're not doing anything. So that's really where the power is. You're building the app on this cloud, and you're just sitting back and, and letting it do its thing. So that's what's really nice, is you never have to worry about any of the stuff that we used to worry about uh, not too long ago, three or four years ago, before uh, the cloud became kind of the norm and, and uh, the scalability of things. There's a lot of customers that are doing things that could never be done before. Anybody watch MLB? Have you seen the stack cast stuff where they, you know, that's all Amazon Web Services behind the scenes, all calculating those, that data. Before that ball even hits the mix, we've already calculated like 7,000 something data points, and they're able to go in there, analyze, and then somebody up top has already pulled that data and figured out exactly what's going on. So they could pull, they could pull a picture before the picture even knows it, or before they even know that that picture is going to hurt itself, or that picture uh, that uh, picture is going to be injured. If you guys heard about Nike doing their testing, so the idea is you can push a person so hard and know there's going to be a breaking point at some point. That's how the analytics they use all these analytics and these data points to say if I push this person another mile, there's a high probability this person is either going to pull a muscle or have some kind of hairline fracture or something. Same idea with concussion. Same idea with the MLB. You could say let's pull that picture. Let's get him out of there because. We need to get, he's going to get injured. And that's all based on this data about how many throws, because they can tell the spin on the ball, they can tell the exact uh, miles per hour, everything, the way it hits the, the mid. You can't do that manually. So all that is the analytics and taking care of and protecting those, um, those sports athletes. So where's I going with that? Oh, the scale and, and, and creating these new, uh, these new services and features based on just some of these, these uh, features that they enable. OK, so we talked about Cognito, one of these services. So, Username and password, which is by default you can set up and then this will uh, scale to millions of users. You can allow users to log in Facebook, Google, um, and the SAML Federation. And when you enable Facebook, it'll create, it'll bring in the uh, Facebook SDK and then give you that, that console area. So when you say, yes, I want to log in Facebook, they'll click on Facebook, it'll go into that, their native interface, log in, and then Cognito will give them those temporary credentials to go in and access your resources, your S3 bucket, whatever it is. And then behind the scenes, the app is just doing all the work. So as that token expires an hour later, a month later, it goes back into Facebook, says, yep, that's still uh, uh, valid. And then we can go ahead and give them those, that access again. So it kind of goes through that whole cycle and does all that management for you. Instead of using a developer key and say, oh, my developer key, all my users are using the same developer key. And then somebody compromises, and it's compromised. And then you have to reissue the app, and you've um, released a key that everybody can use. So let's enable just one of these features so the user can um, log in with, like, let's say, email. Um, MFA is an option, which is a lot of important for a lot of the enterprise. By default, you can use um, 
multi-factor. So when they log in using a password, they can also say, be sent a text notification and they'll have to put in that extra form of um, um, authentication. And then we can set up like six. I'm going to reduce it to six um, characters, minimum characters. And then I'm not enterprise, so I'm just going to say six. So what this is doing and seeing is creating Cognito User Bowl. It talks about some of the stuff that's doing there. And then getting it ready for, for this app. So this is kind of basically credit username and password. And then um, no MFA, and it's ready to go. So the next part time we launch this app, we launch it, it will allow the user to anonymously access a few things like send um, analytics. And then if they log in, uh, they can create a username and password right there in the app. And then they can log in, and then they can access like maybe that private data that we talked about like in S3. So the other piece that uh, Mobile Hub does is, remember how everything's tied in best practices, so this optional required. So depending on your app use case, like a lot of, I, most apps, I like to have uh, an option to use it before somebody forces me to log in. Right? You, if you're forced to log into Facebook, sometimes you just drop it, right? You're just like, I don't, I have no need for Facebook, I won't play this game, but I have no need for Facebook, so I'll just delete it in most of the cases. But, um, so this is where it gives you an option. So by default, we can set up the sample app or uh, integration. So say, okay, optional means we'll set up the anonymous and thus you know, allow them to log in if they want. And they can access certain resources. And then required, basically, we would just lock it down. They pop open the app. And best practices, they can't get to anything until they actually authenticate. So behind the scenes, Cognito has two roles <coughs> that a user would assume. And one is uh, anonymous, and then one is the authenticated. So the event anonymous allows them to do like just the basics, that public folder and, and maybe some throw in the analytics, right? Throw in that. But if we say required, we basically can't do much of anything because we've locked them down, so no, we're not great. And again, it just depends on what your app is doing, what you want to block it down. Like. If you want to uh, later require them when they um, make a purchase or if they want to access certain resources, that's when you lock it down and say, okay, now it's required. And then you can just put them in uh, some of the resources, lock them down to only that authorized, the authenticated user. So right now I'll just do optional so I can just demonstrate a little bit more. And then that's done. That's created there. And then, Good question. question. Yeah. Um, if the user needs to reset their email, if you use the email and password, they need to reset their password. That's another great thing about Cognito, yes. It's already built in. So they, they provide their email address in, in there or whatever, when they create that user account, and they forget, they forget every day, it seems like. Then, yeah, Cognito will take care of it. You don't have to have a whole system in place. It'll take care of it. And the email template and all, is that configurable, do you know? Yeah, and um, yeah, if you go, and then again, remember the advanced piece we're talking about, where in resources, you can click on it, it'll take you to that user pool, and then you can fine tune the domain, where it's coming from, um, and then the app name, if you want to be really specific, like say, you need to reset your uh, username, or reset your password, or something. How would the, sorry, um, how would the biometric uh, recognition show, should it be handled through the mobile app, or the cognitive has the the biometric yeah, the fingerprint facial recognition. So. Um, yeah, we, we've just been talking about it. If you have a use case, I want to talk to you about that because there's been, um, he's talking about the facial recognition and, and thumbprint. Um, you could have them log into Facebook and, and have the facial recognition be a third party. Now, I, I don't know of any app that's using it for like a full 100% accuracy okay. to say, you know, like get them access to uh, uh, private folders or whatever it might be. but as a second way to authenticate somebody like at a convention or something might be good. Um, but using like the thumbprint piece, um, yeah, I haven't had too many use cases or uh, customers ask for that, but where you tie in with username and password and tie it in with, with the thumbnail breach. But I want to talk about that because we've had, um, internally we've talked about, we, we don't have a good use case where we come up with like a nice big picture to tell them, we can tell the story because I read a lot of the blogs so I can put together a story to say, okay, this makes sense. Okay. Yeah, and then we'll talk about the image recognition, the opportunity there too. So you don't have a lot of customers that are doing it. Yeah, they might be. I just I haven't. No one's come talk to us or our team about like specifics about turning in um, the additional authentication pieces. Other than MFA, that's the most popular, right? Because MFA is is consistent. It's there. It's like you have the one phone number. You know, you can probably spoof phone number, but you set up the text, you set up MFA. And it just works. It's been there, you know, time release, Google has it. They all kind of provided that. And the SMS is nice because you're, that's your device. You, you have it in hand. So whether it's you and then your device, that's kind of the second way of authenticating. So, so if I can, with the MFA, if I can like Duo, I can still use, I can use the Duo. With. Yeah, so right now we only have the MFA with text, SMS. You can't do like Duo or you can't use like, unless Google has their app, the Google. 
Authenticator. Authenticator. Google Authenticator. Okay, yeah. So any of those, yeah, it doesn't tie in with any of those, but um, but you can use SMS right uh, by default. So by default with SMS, just like with um, what is it? GitHub. Uh, we use GitHub all the time with SMS, where you log in, it sends you text uh, notification, and ask for that key. But I should still be able to use Duo, um, if I, because you said you support SAML. Right? So I should still be able to use Duo. Right? Is that what Duo is to SAML? I think you can use the SAML 2.0. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you can use SAML, then tie it in together. Okay. Yeah. And uh, talk to me after because you can figure out the, the flow and I can show you some of the, the basic flow and advanced flow for Cardino when you're using SAML and single sign on and, uh, and see if that might work for you. Yeah. Okay. So this is the API. So think about just the regular endpoint. So um, I think we'll do um, vehicle if I don't have it already. So I'm just going to do a vehicle API name. And then again, restrict API access to sign in users. So I can have them like. You can have all users allow them to get, but then only authenticated users to post certain, you know, the scenarios like that. And then this is just giving you a basic um, endpoint. So I'm going to say uh, cars, just to make it more consistent with this. And then this behind the scenes is going to create a, a Lambda function and the front end API gateway. This talks about a little bit there. And so that's all it is creating in this cloud. It be familiar with cloud formation, but it creates this behind the scenes this stack. That's creating those two pieces where we have the picture in here, API gateway lambda. Tying in the Cognito user that we just created for a new password, our Cognito user pool. Then we're creating this API with the vehicle endpoint and then um, the cars. So we do a get, post, delete, whatever it is. And then um, the lambda function will have, but it's like a Node.js that just spits back whatever it might be. So it kind of gives you that whole flow. And then in the end, you end up with this endpoint, which is this really long API gateway endpoint that you can custom, customize, you can put your uh, custom domain to it, and then that's your API. Yeah, if anybody you know, like, like Parse have used uh, Parse before, Parse server when it was around, so basically parse.com and then slash whatever your endpoint might be. And that's sort of the idea, is like that's, we're building out that core API, so anything you want to do with those, with that information, so you could have them log in or anonymous, and then make that API call. And I'll show you uh, what that looks like here in a second. So as what we're building is, we're building out all these resources. Cognito pools, S3 bucket, so we click on this, it'll load the S3 bucket, and so on. So we've configured Cloud Logic, which is, again, powered by API Gateway and Lambda. And then uh, let's do Storage Gateway, because this one's easy. And then enable. So all it's doing is creating an S3 bucket, and then it's throwing in like a sample image or two. And then on top of that, it's tying in with your uh, Cognito authentication. So it's saying, okay, I'm going to create a public folder just for a trial, and then I'll have anybody that's in that anonymous piece that can upload into that public folder, and then anybody who logs in can upload into the private folder within the public. Quick question on the user roles. Can you assign roles to them as well? Yes. What they can access? Yeah, there's finding roles. By default, this the uh, default is the unauthenticated, authenticated, and then you can add groups to those roles and then fine tune it even more. So you get involved with like. The admin piece, you do the user piece, and then allow them certain access. And, and then you change that via API. Yes. Yeah. Command line, or you can go to the console, or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, you, and, so you're saying you define the groups, and then you put people in the groups. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if you guys want to talk about some of the deep, deeper stuff on that, because <laughs> this is the where the IM piece, where the fine grain, you can get just literally. If you're in a great chair, then you can have access. If you're not in the chair standing up, you can't have access. And it gets deep involved, but if you can, if you need to. But by default, we just want to keep it like anonymous, log in with some of the social provider, username, and password, which covers the, the gamut of things. And then if you want to go in and say like, okay, you're from SAML, single sign-in, we're spreading the cookies around, everything else, then that's great, you can do that too. But by default, this is kind of setting up the stage to say, okay, I understand how this works, and then you can go dive in. Because otherwise, some, if you want to try to dive in soon, before you even get it, like it's all of a sudden you're drowning. You're like, oh, I drowned it before I, before I finish this. So we just enable analytics. So behind the scenes, again, this is creating a, um, a pinpoint application and getting the SDK ready for the app. So when we launch the app, the sample one, in this case, we'll launch it and it'll automatically start tracking the demographic, the user demographics, the session, the session link, whatever it might be. And that's pretty much it. I want to just do those four right now. We'll come back to conversational bots. And then uh, we integrate. So here's the cool piece about the, the sample. So we talked about uh, one of the options is downloading this custom uh, sample app, which is we built. It'll have 
a menu of all these items that we enable that we can interact interact with it kind of does a proof of concept okay this works I see it this we can scale we can test it whatever it might be and then when we're ready we go and download those SDK pieces and then go piece by piece like oh I want to enable the S3 piece or I want to enable the this piece um, of it and then run through it so mostly the things that have the SDK like the the um, the analytics SDK, or if you enable Facebook, we have the Facebook SDK in there, and how to move that in there and get that in there. So once we have it, so I'm going to do an iOS Swift, is that if that's okay? And I'll say, um, so right there was building for a few seconds, and then it's going to download a zip file, which is um, a project that I'm going to launch in in Xcode, and then it'll launch, and then it'll connect into the resources that I just created with all the constants already built in, all the endpoints and everything. <laughs> so, you think about, I've walked through kind of slowly, but if you have an idea or concept, you want to start enable some of these features, you can just click on click on the link them, and then you can delete the project if you wanted to. We also have import, which I could talk about. I think that's important for the automation if you want to keep recreate this or clone it. We have that feature too, but the idea is to create these little features, and you can tear it down if you want to, if you're done. Build the sample app, okay, recognize it works, it's great, integrate it with your own app, and then move on to the next one if you want to. So um, the idea is just it builds it out, gets it staged, gets it ready for you so you can get a working example of it and then move on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, on that screen, I saw another tab called JavaScript. So if you click on that, would that download like a, a web app or anything? So yeah, there's pieces when we talk about that web and streaming app, there's some web integrations. So we have like a React.js uh, sample, we have an Ionic sample. And then uh, maybe future will be something like a React Native kind of sample, but it won't be like a fully functional mobile app. It'll be more of a web app. So it'll be great. So you can have Babel, you can do command line stuff. So that's also an option there where we're building out as well for those mobile web app or hybrid um, developers. And so yeah, if there's any a lot of cross platform that are doing like the JavaScript piece uh, with uh, Ionic and um, any of the other ones, come talk to me a little bit because we're we're kind of building that roadmap and I want to see. Where people are with those with the non-native, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. So basically, JavaScript um, is you know the influx of a lot of the, the mobile developers coming in and, and want to do uh, JavaScript. So there's the Angular, there's Ionic, there's there's a lot of the different pieces that they're using to develop these mobile apps, and there's native, a uh, hybrid versions, uh, progressive web, whatever it might be. So there's trying to figure out what's the best fit for a lot of these developers coming in, what's, what, what's the chain, where are the dynamics, um, and then also supporting the, the, the hard data as well. Yeah? You mentioned React, are you guys using yeah. Angular on the roadmap at all? Or? So Angular's on there, there's examples, but yeah, so we want to talk to you guys about like what, because this is a learning process as well for us, like what um, what the Angular developers are doing, what the Ionics are doing, um, what the uh, React folks are doing. So. Uh, what, what are you expecting when you're, are you a web developer that's moving into mobile? Are you all in with, with React? Are you all in with Angular? You know, those kind of things. Because if you think about it, if we had to support all of it, we would just be, right, you know, just like you guys are going overload with some of the frameworks. So, and then React Native is another big one, right? So you create these, these features and how, how that integrates with some of the, the SDKs that we have with like um, push notifications is a good one, right? So all these web apps may not, you know, be fully functional with some of these push notifications, but maybe you don't need that. So um, some of those ideas in there, and, and let's talk, because this is serious, and I want to make sure that we're we're not missing the boat here, and we have all those scenarios covered. And that's kind of why we turn back to some of this, the main API, because I don't care if you're mobile, web, whatever it might be, because that's kind of like, we're seeing a lot of shift. We're seeing a lot of, like, mobile, web, cross-platform, JavaScript, everything, and you have these, these apps, you don't know if they're native or not, and the idea is you have this API, this hardcore backend that can scale, it's really, you're just really making HTML calls, right? So HTTP calls, whatever it is, not HTML, HTTP calls, basically. And you're making this call to get push, but whatever it is. And that covers a majority of those use cases, whether you're calling from um, JavaScript, you're calling from C Sharp, you're calling from Java, it doesn't really matter. So that's where we're here, because we're really building that backend, but we also want to support the mobile developer, get them to that next step, you know? And that's what I, the idea is here, is like where we've created this native app and we are able to open this Xcode project and then run it right away. So in, um, in the JavaScript solution, there's in there, there's the integrated where you can build it, you can run it, you can do the package, you can upload your own packages. And there's a, a, there's a blog one that we just did with React.js uh, where it's a restaurant. 
sample app. So it talks about how you log in with your username password, and then it's, it's a web app. So it looks good on your browser, and, and that's about it. So um, there's that solution too if you want. Do you guys have a same like, simulation for like, the Alexa skills at all? For what? Like Alexa skills? Uh, no, we don't do any uh, anything for Alexa skills. We mostly for <coughs> Amazon Lex, mm -hmm. and we integrate that with the Amazon Lex. But we don't talk about the skills or any templates or blueprints, but the Lambda piece, I can talk about if we have time, and, and Lambda has a lot of the blueprints for uh, Alexa and Amazon Alexa because that's what they do. That's, that's, if anybody's familiar with uh, Amazon Alexa, is the skills are built with the same idea with Amazon Alexa, which I haven't talked about yet, but that natural language, you make a command into uh, Alexa, and Alexa calls a Lambda function. So that's why we talk about, remember we talked about that serverless piece? If you so now you go to Alexa, you're creating a Lambda function, and all that is is Lambda function is the code that does a certain thing. Say, if somebody says, give me the weather, behind the scenes, the Lambda function says, get weather, and it's going to an API, it says, get weather. Or, here's the weather for the day, you know, or whatever it is, like, you've got a weather station, I'm sending you data, and I send it to Alexa, say, or Alexa, and I say, the weather today is cloudy, and then that could set a post and go into your API. So, the idea is you're just setting up that interface to, uh, to that API, and Lambda is the, is the heart of it. You have to use Lambda. You can use your own server, but the idea is to use Lambda in the back end so that it can scale and you don't care how many users are using the Alexa uh, skill. Um, and the next, next question would be was, how do I, uh, as an Alexa developer, how do I develop an Amazon Alexa chatbot? And I don't have a good answer for you yet. <laughs> okay, so by default, so I just downloaded this, to, uh, zip file, open it up, and then inside here has the some of the frameworks in there ready to go for some of the, the features that we have enabled in Mobile Hub. And then, um, I got my app here, let's see. I'll run it in an actual device so you guys can see. I'm gonna run it through a quick time. Take a couple minutes to figure out, drop down, and then build it out. So basically, you have to build up, uh, sign everything you, you release. How many iOS developers here? Android developers? Hybrid. Hybrid developers? React Native. React Native, okay. And the rest don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't everybody, that's weird. Okay, what else is out there that I'm missing? Web developer. <laughs> Web developer, go to end of mobile? How about that? Yeah. Okay. All right, well, anyway, that, the, the signing is a requirement for, for, for this, and that's why a lot of people, uh, mobile developers getting started, they'll like, oh, I'm starting with, um, with uh, Android. It's like, oh, okay, why are you starting with Android? Oh, it's just like, it's so much easier to see where it's like, okay. And that's true, because you don't have to have a license, you don't have to have a lot of restrictions. Um, and the most popular operating system out there now is Android. But, there's a but. I won't spread my opinions on it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, out of all across the board, it's the number one. But the idea is like, you have this number one operating system, but you know, if you, like, let's say you build a game and you release it and on the um, Google Play Store. Half of those Android users can't even touch it, can't play it. So like, I don't care if you have a billion Android users, half of them are gone right away, okay? And then you take the countries outside the US, half of them can't even see the ads that you do. So the idea is like, if you want to make money and you want to integrate and you want to, you want to engage those users, you think you're going to be able to engage your users that are in China? Probably not, because you probably don't, unless, you know, we do have the, uh, the Chinese uh, push notification, which we um, can implement there, but not in Mobile Hub, but you can on the side. And that's ways to kind of get through that. Um, but the idea is like, you know, think about when you create these apps, a lot of the game developers think about that platform. What 
platform is going to give me the best bang for the buck. It's going to give me, you know, if you're a, a freemium-based uh, app, whatever it might be. So there's a lot of the going in on that right now. That's still been talking about that for years, right? Freemium, you charge for it. You know, who's paying for these apps? Who's using these apps? What are, what are, what are we bringing in for revenue? And there's a lot of enterprise stuff too, where if you're not making any money, you have a finite set of users that are your business customer B2B, and that's really not an issue at all. So that's not even a problem. So if the customer has Android devices, then you've got to create an Android um, application to work with maybe even some of the older ones like KitKat. And so it's been around for six years. But okay. So the idea is so we launched this. Um, Usually this isn't five minutes, but it took me like 20. But um, you would download this, the, so we integrated some of these features. We downloaded this zip file, and then we launched the, um, launched the project code. I had to sign it for one. And then in here, you can see, uh, this is on my phone, that there's the sign-in option, which is you can demonstrate uh, signing in and registering stuff like you sign in. I can create that account, forgot account, account, create the user, and then I can sign in the uh, login user. And then user data storage. Remember we talked about this public-private thing? So this is a sample of, uh, image that we put in there, and it's in a public folder within this bucket that I own. And then this user launched it. So anybody who launches this app will have this example image right now, okay? And then if I go into private, it's like, oh, I'm gonna store some stuff private, you have to be signed in to uh, access this private information. So if I go in here, and let's say, it probably prompt me for permissions, okay? Uh, and then I can go on camera. So this is uh, anybody seen this before? No, that was a deer down the street at the park. The giant deer. Oh, so you guys seen it? Oh, they're on the river. It's like twenty feet tall or something. It's massive. Oh yeah, that's what you guys. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I was just looking down, so I took a picture. So, so I just took that. And now I'm going to upload it to uh, to S3. I think this is probably like a 20 minute file, so it's going to stream it uh, through there and upload to public. So anybody using uh, this app again, they'll see this once the deer PNG shows up. And I can download it, and, uh, pin it, cache it, whatever it is. And then if I have private logged in, then I get to do the same thing and upload it to private, and only I can see those images. So it kind of gives you an idea that the whole end to end where you're protecting your data if you want to, or your user data. User data. That must be a huge file. Um, and then, so user engagement. So when we first launched the app, it's already collecting data. So it's already collected the demographics, it's already collecting the session data for us. We didn't have to do anything because the SDK is already included. And then, if we wanted to, we could demo some of the custom events we were talking about. Like if it's the chat, that person was chatting or something. This is a custom um, custom event. It just says here demo attribute one and two, so you can kind of see what custom events they were. It could be anything like. You reach a certain level, or maybe somebody every time you want to, somebody um, clicks on a certain uh, feature, like they disabled sound or something, and you want to know that. So you can say, like, future percent of users don't care about the sound, so let's not work on that feature in the future, whatever it might be. And then monetization is a big one. So you can see how many people are actually making this would be an uh, in app purchase example. So anytime does, somebody does an in app purchase, you can track that and then put a value to that user. So you can tie in that user to what they did, to that custom event pull in a whole funnel and see, okay, that's the lifetime event. What is that person purchasing? And then how many times that person has actually launched the app? So you kind of get the idea. You're building out this like whole list of segments and say, okay, here's my idea of user that has, the person that's making the in-app purchases has launched my app X number of times and the session based session duration is typically 30 seconds or more per day. So you kind of like look at that. And then so when you go back to develop apps, you figure out, what do those users don't care about? What do those users do care about? Who's sharing? Who's doing what? And who's purchasing? And then you can put it all together. That's tying in some of that analytics data with um, with all the other stuff going on in your app. And then when you want to go to create these new features, uh, or like we talked about Android. So if somebody creates an app and all of a sudden they realize like how come they have you know twenty percent more users on iOS, um, and then they realize like okay how many people are actually on this Android version? The fragmentation they can look at and say okay. I want to create this new feature that's in uh, has sleep mode in Android 6, and then realize like only 2% of my users are on Android 6. Should I work on a feature? Probably not, right? So it's going to save you a lot of time and resources to try to figure out like let's not work on this feature when only six, two, three percent are on running uh, Marshmallow or higher, and that's when the feature was enabled after Marshmallow. So we wouldn't want to uh, create those, uh, work on those resources or allocate resources to work on those problems. 
to, to get out that yeah. is there like a like a query uh, engine available or is that through API calls? Yeah. So both. So it'll aggregate data. I can show you just a few minutes. We'll show the dashboard. Just aggregates the like monthly active users, daily active users, and all that. And then it'll show that custom event. And then you can choose to dump it to S3, which is the raw data. So if you, you can enable analytics in any of the cloud providers, but just keep a, a watchful eye and understanding that sometimes you don't own that data. Like one of the services is really great. There's Fabric. It's awesome. Beautiful. Like interface is great, but that data is going somewhere. It's going somewhere. We don't know where. The idea here is you, you own that data. So the dashboard is like, okay, that's great, you can aggregate the data, but you own that data, that's your raw data. And like you said, if you're not ready, you can go and maybe you have an analytics engine or you have a, um, what are the other big uh, analytics UI? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can have them tie into this, say, okay, here's my S3 data, here's my raw data, and they can analyze. You can just dump it, but you own it, you control it, and then you can put whatever you want in there. And you can, can, you know, can make a lot of these custom events and like, Track these users all the way through the whole cycle. Yeah. Does the pinpoint have the heat map, heat map way of tracking and then session rate? Uh, no, it'll tell you the session. I think the session length and duration average, but it doesn't like put it up in like nice heat map like you might see with like um, uh, Flurry or, or local Linux or something like that. Yeah, it's just got the most the basic, the basic stuff that, uh, for monetization and, and session based and that information. Okay. So that was, uh, oh, and then the last piece was this cloud logic. Now this kind of gets, it's, remember we created this API, the vehicle endpoint? And then, um, and again, this isn't a fully functional app. This, I mean, it is, but it's not the prettiest thing, right? Because the engineer is like, okay, we're gonna create this endpoint. We put a car path in there. And think about just your regular API, and then we can do a sample get on it, and then, again, this is just creating these little link fields, and then it's gonna invoke it, and then this, doesn't really mean anything to you, but if we go into the Lambda function, so what this did is the car's endpoint did a get on this number I talked about, that really long endpoint, this API gateway development, which is the uh, the version of it, and then um, slash whatever cars, and I'm doing a get, and that's it, sending that to, from the device to API gateway, and then API gateway says, okay, you're not logged in, you're not authenticated, go, go, yep, I can pass that along to Lambda, and then Lambda says, yep, you can do a get, and then, I'll, and then this is the uh, JSON response from Lambda. That's it. That's demonstrating that whole process. And so you can imagine you can lock that down. Let's like say we want to do API Gateway or Lambda, lock it down a little bit further, and we can make those calls kind of, um, you know, make, you know, all the gets could be anonymous, and then anything you want to post might be controlled. Say, no, you can't do post, or uh, whatever it might be, you can control that. So all this is is just showing you the idea of you're running the mobile device connected again this is doesn't have to be swift doesn't have to be objective c could be react could be anything just calling that http endpoint and doing a git post whatever with your javascript sdk and then it runs back and, and do it because you're connected so the idea is like it's send here's my api here's all the definition of my api go build the mobile app the web app the, the creative app whatever it is and and run through it so um and that's that that just demonstrates and that's the idea here is Nice to have a working demo so you kind of just, you don't miss any of the pieces like, um, for instance, when we go back to the chatbot, the permission piece is really important when you go like, uh, you forget to like enable permission or check for permission to access a photo album, like an iOS. If you forget to ask, ask, ask for permission, the app will crash. And those kind of things, like you're doing it on your own, you're like, oh shoot, it just crashed and then you don't know, is it Amazon, is it your front end code, is it back end code, yeah. So when you made those API endpoints and everything, did did it automatically create a database with that Dynamo database and then it's... In this case, no, because we didn't enable di uh, the database. We okay. just enabled the API gateway in Lambda. Okay. So Lambda's holding on. So it's just calling this something, nothing's going to return right. because you don't have it connected to anything. Right. So Lambda's doing the data, yeah, it's, it's pulling like raw fake data. It's so is it easy to just connect it to a MySQL database that you have on an EC2 instance already? or? Yeah, sure, but it'd have to be, so with RDS you'd have to do the UPC. So if you had, um, if you're familiar with VPC, you'd have to connect it and protect it. So the Lambda, the Lambda function right now could be set in there, but you'd have to create that Lambda function inside the virtual environment, and then you'd connect that into right to SQL. So yeah, it's just say get vehicle, and then Lambda would go and say, select star from vehicle, right? And then pull back and then turn it into JSON, JSONify it, and then bring it back. Same thing. Okay. That's, all, that's all it's doing. So yeah, it can connect, and, or it could go to, 
um, any of the APIs, like it could the Meetup API, it could do any API from there that it could call and say vehicle. It could go to the Kelly Blue Book API if that was open. So it, the idea is that the Lambda function can just go anywhere you want it to. And then if it was going to go to RDS or your your uh, one of your private uh, SQL data servers, then you want it in, inside of the VPC. So you can call it, and then it would call in private. So it was the only thing that could call those uh, resources. Does that make sense? So the whole, do you see how flow comes in where Cognito gives those credentials, and then I'm able to make this call into um, API Gateway. Well, then how does Cognito then, like if I already have a user database set up in MySQL, how does Cognito go work into that workflow? Just the same exact way? Yeah, you would have the tie-ins like so. Your would you have your hundreds of users on your SQL database, or yeah. you probably. Well, I think what most of them would do is inside of their MySQL, they would have like a, a SQL query user or some kind of a groups. And then in Lambda, would say, okay, if this was a specific user base or maybe we set up groups in Cognito, those users could do this query. Or uh, Lambda is only one that can actually run this query. So to say, okay, it could run the query, but nobody else can access it. But they can access the, the get, and then behind the scenes, the Lambda function has a user that's only specific for querying that data. So that's how they would set it up. So it would be like, a, they obviously would be root, but the Lambda function would use a, a user group within MySQL to say, okay, I'm only gonna do a call. That just in case you protect it all the way down. So that's an example of, of creating the uh, sample app. So we built this whole backend infrastructure. We created the sample app, and then I'll show you what that looks like on, in the console we talked about resources. So remember we talked about so S3 bucket, um, we click here, this will take us to that S3 bucket. We should see that image finally uploaded. See, we see the public and protected and private, so we to public, and then there's that DR, 17 megs. And then the 206, that's the sample file. So anybody who downloads this app starts uploading to this folder, and then um, inside the private, we'll, or the, yeah, the private, you'll see uh, images in there. So inside the private, you'll see the, the user IDs, and I wouldn't even be able to access this. The user could access Within that folder, they would have their uh, Cognito identifier, and then when they go in there, they would have access to anything <coughs> that, that folder at all, anything that folder deeper. And then, so yeah, so you just start here, and then you have all these resources go into Lambda function. So here's that Lambda function we talked about, which is that Node.js by default, and then it goes back in, it gets the request from API Gateway, and then it just responds with uh, the event, which is the stringifies the event, and remember, it came back and wrap that JSON HTTP 200 event and then send it back to that user and that's all it is. So if I went into, um, so if I went back into API Gateway here, <coughs> this is the call here. So it's making these calls right here, there's a cars, and then um, there's an endpoint here, which is, So this is the APC, this is the API point right there. And then, not only that, so it tells you how many API calls, latency, integration latency, uh, and then 400, 500 access pairs. So by default, you have this default analytics with, uh, <coughs> with API Gateway, and you can also tie that in with your own pinpoint if you wanted to. So building out an API is not that difficult, but managing in all the resources and your own server, scaling, and then having this control over it is, is really the benefit of using API Gateway. There's really, uh, no reason to use the API, or not use API Gateway, unless you really have like a, a solid use case that maybe you have this certain server that can't, you know, needs to run and consistently maybe has web sockets or something like um, that you need to continuously run, JBox or something that has a specific use case that this doesn't fill. So that makes sense, the API Gateway and the Lambda, okay, we're done with that. Let's beat that dead horse. You, you know, uh, uh, on that graph you just had to use like, uh, latency. Yeah. Can you, can you drill into that? Or is that just um, It's just a, not really not a drillable. So this uh, should go into uh, like the integration link. It should CloudWatch logs or CloudWatch events. Okay. And then you can drill into five minutes, one minute um, accuracy, and then you can set alarms on it. So that's the other thing. It's like, let's say somebody's calling your API and they're calling it tune time, also you realize like all of a sudden you got this bill and you're like, oh, okay, great. So you can actually fine tune it and figure out like who's making these calls and where they're coming from and then actually create alarms like just with your billing too. So if you, you create a bill right now or an alarm that says like, if my bill goes over five bucks this month, send me an alarm. Alarm being like an email or text, whatever it is. So if you want to do that, you can set that up and you can, 
you can set this and say, okay, um, and by default, without using those the, the keys with throttle, you can throttle your API by default to say, I only want to set this up to five requests per second because I think that's plenty for any mobile developer because it should be like per user, right? So if somebody's doing this like per second, you got a really high user base. And so you, maybe you can set it up if you want. You can set it up and fine tune it and kind of throttle it from the beginning if you wanted to. But by default, it should be just fine. But there might be some runaway uh, developer or script guy that's trying to run through and then test your endpoint there might be running, running multiple calls that are saying your endpoint. And so, yeah, there's a billing alarms and that goes straight into CloudWatch uh, events. Okay, so back to, back to the slide. I think we're going to get this slide open. Okay. I think I messed up the, um, yeah. what time is it? How long? Yeah, six, eight, eight o'clock. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, that is the, uh, and if you have any questions about the mobile hub stuff, then let me know afterwards because I'll, I'll stick around. Um, and then this is the important piece where, for mobile developers, they're excited about the whole discussion of bots and uh, voices and vision. So there's three AI pieces that we uh, want to talk about that kind of thing that mobile developers can take advantage of and, uh, and get, their, get started uh, right away to uh, into the AI natural language and, and stuff. So I'm going to talk about what those three services are for, for everyday use and then um, how we integrate that with, uh, with our app that we just built. And so we'll build out a sample one so you can look at it and then see what it can do and then we'll integrate it with the app. <coughs> so um, anybody have used any of the service? Anybody use a chatbot currently that's not, not part of Amazon? Anybody use chatbot? As a user or as a developer? As a developer. Okay. Anybody interested in chatbots integrating with, like, with their app? Maybe after this. Okay, I want to go through the three. If you have any questions with them, uh, let me know. So, to break this down a little bit, see how they, I put this like shade here? So, all these pieces behind the scenes are the big advanced topics that we're talking about where the, um, uh, the AI teams can build this machine learning. You can put uh, images in there or text, whatever it might be. All this like data, and analytics, and weather stuff that you can analyze, and using like services and, and servers, GPU, CPU, and get advanced um, analytics from that. But then there's the piece up here. These three new services that we've taken the high level and making this more available to uh, mobile developers or um, web developers, whatever it might be, to integrate and use some of these. AI and machine learning stuff without actually going in and understanding the machine learning models. That's really what it's all about. So it's like taking it to the mainstream. So instead of like building out all these images of all these millions of people and world facial ticks or whatever it might be, then um, <coughs> building this out, building your own it really model is you can take uh, visual recognition, which is take visual video or images and it can analyze those for certain things. And so by default, it can recognize uh, male, female, it can do an estimated age, it can do um, if they're smiling, if they're sad, if they're wearing glasses. So the, by the default, does a lot of that stuff, a lot of the demographics. It does um, scenery stuff. It'll tell you, if I take a picture outside, it may show that deer, you think it's a deer, or grass, or river, um, a train, whatever it might be, it'll pick up that general stuff. Uh, so that's the kind of the basics of it, where you throw in, and, and it also takes video too. So and it does celebrities. So the other one is celebrities. Um, and there's kind of a scene. I think is the one that's doing. Um, they're taking a, a step further, building out their own models with uh, with politicians. So when they take all these uh, hours and hours of video, they can scan the video, looking for all the politicians. They know a politician. They tag them, and so they don't have to have people looking at these videos daily and, and recognizing these politicians. And then they can categorize them and index them and say this is the you know this is who it is, and then categorize all those um, those people in the video without actually interacting with it. So that's the idea. So this is and so you get whatever recognition has identified of all these different pieces. So if that were to be like uh, the age estimate, so this is a really good example. Throw in an image, and the mobile developers could use this by just taking that. And an image of you learning from it. So I can take an image, a picture of everybody at the front door. And then as you come in the door the next day, because I'll know who you are, I'll come in the next day and say, okay, I recognize John, I recognize Lisa, I recognize Christine, everybody. And it could build a model that way. So basically it's a simple way to do it. 
or if it could say that person was wearing glasses yesterday, not today, what's you know, it could do that kind of a rough analysis on that, and it could use it as like a third third way of authenticating. So we could like somebody like in a conference, somebody has registered, I'm Dennis, and I have I come up with my past, and here we go. Instead of like maybe looking for a full ID, it just already had taken a picture, and it just by default there was already a camera there, and it could identify them, and with a 96, 90 percent. Uh, success rate says great that's who you are come on in so you kind of like think about like an uber drivers will probably end up doing something like this where you don't have to ask the person's name there's an already a camera to attach to these devices or attached to the rear mirror takes it by default analyzes and then just if it, there's no problem that there's less than 80 percent accuracy and that person doesn't seem like they who they are like somebody steals my phone and walks in that uber and then wants to attack that uber driver the idea is they even have that second form of authentication just by using their the picture of that person. So they can build these models out and use those pictures to, um, to use recognition and be able to make decisions based on the accuracy. So uh, the other piece of speech quality, so that was takes the text to speech. So think about any like audiobooks and um, accessibility um, apps out there, anytime like sort of reading voice, reading um, an email to you, say, oh, read all my emails to me on the road. That would be something like that would be set up a voice and it could read that information to you. Um, really popular with some of the, the children's books these days. You can do inflection, some of the voices you can have them whisper now. You can set up different uh, mouth movements. You can do angles. So you can now they're tying in like um, artificial, you know, like robots and, and characters, 3D characters, 4D characters typed in with, with the, the speech. Like say Dennis, and the mouth would move with it and make it look like she's saying Dennis. Um, so that, that's a, a, another use case. And then, uh, and then I think there's different languages and different a lot of different users that you can choose different voices, like a boy's voice, a girl's voice, a more formal, um, European voice, whatever it might be, uh, there's options there. And some sound more robotic, some sound more natural. And then the Lex chatbot is interesting because this takes, there's two pieces of this. It's natural language, so think about Alexa, natural language, and it takes it and puts it into text, and then, you know, run the command. Um, so remember, we have the vehicle API. When we call get vehicle, I could just say, we have it all set up, and then I could set this up to be a chatbot, and I could just say, get vehicle. And everything else, once it gets to get vehicle, and likes translates that into text, it's doing exactly the same thing you've done already, calls the API if somebody, if somebody were to say get. So think about that just as another way to front your existing API with a natural language interface. So right there, you've got, you don't have to get confused with any of this like platform, the machine learning and AI. You've integrated this chat, and all, all it does all the work with the machine language and so behind the scenes, and does that natural language translation. So you can just say, get vehicle. And it'll get the vehicle, because it goes and makes says, get vehicle, and calls your API in the back end. The other piece is the text. So it ties in with text, so you can just say, get vehicle, so you type in text, and then it'll be able to go and call your API as if you were to type in um, or click on get text or get uh, get vehicle. So that could be in, um, integrated with like a SMS. So I could say like I could tie in with uh, Twitter or a phone number and say you know I can vote. You know have you seen some of those places where you can vote uh, with your phone and you can say hashtag or something like that. It could take that Lex and just analyze that data and then turn it into an API command as if you were going to the website. Click on Cynthia. Cynthia's a singer, and I voted for her. I voted. It's basically saying, vote for Cynthia. And then that's a vote. That's it. Because it's doing the same thing. It's just taking that natural language and making that one API. So just a lot of those users are using these pieces to kind of front their, their web apps, their mobile apps, to kind of give a better uh, or new user interface for some of those customers. And one of the examples uh, is the Kelly Blue Book. Uh, did anybody use Kelly Blue Book before? For, uh, for getting that used car vehicle value. So there's like 15 questions you drop down, a year, make a model, and everything else. And so we created this proof of concept where we can go and, and create this chatbot. And remember, everything comes from Lex. It goes in there, and it uh, analyzes the, the voice, and then it makes commands, and it goes back into Lambda, and then Lambda decides whether it's validated or not, and then it can make those decisions on um, what it wants. And I'll show you what uh, what that looks like in, in practice, because to see an image or see a, a diagram of it, of how uh, the Lex chatbot goes into Lambda and then it makes that call back is interesting and then you'll be able to see how that all kind of ties in together with intent. So 
Amazon Lex is uh, conversational interfaces. Remember, just conversational interfaces, think of it that way. Using voice and text, powered by the deep learning technologies of Alexa. So we've taken that whole engine and made it possible to put it in, in mobile, could be web app, whatever it might be, um, texting, voice, and you could do voice through the through, through web browser if you wanted to. Uh, recognition is a deep learning based image recognition based on what that predetermined criteria is, that, like the, the male, female, smiling, not smiling, estimated age, landscapes, whatever it is, like a huge list of, of ideas. Useful because you could, like, I could send all my thousands of uh, family photos that I've never indexed before, and you could send it in there, and, and I don't know if you've noticed, is it Google Drive or Google. Amazon? Google Drive and then Amazon is doing it now is, uh, with some of the new operating systems where it says you can actually search for somebody or your kid now. That's what it's using. It's using recognition or a type of service like that under the, under the table. So you'll be able to see, like, you can do it to yourself, like, send, like, a hundred of these photos and identify, like, my son, his name's Iron, and he's eight years old, and every time I upload an image, it'll recognize him, and then it can categorize it. So I can just say Iron, and then it'll show me all of Iron pictures, and then you can get deeper in that. So my default does all that, because that stuff is manual. If you've ever done in the past where, like, you have this photo album and you're tagging each one, and like it's it's painful, especially because we take so many pictures these days with our phones. So recognition is really helpful with that. Um, and like some of the police uh, forces are using that. There's a, a person in Washington County, Oregon now uses that, where they um, they scan a lot of those users, uh, or a lot of the, um, I can't remember if it's, uh, they're in the jail site, they're, they're taking the, the snapshots, and they can recognize um, based on what previous data they had in there. So that's going to be even more common now. Take a picture, upload it to recognition, it'll recognize, and then do the matches. We've seen that in movies. Now it's very uh, useful and mainstream now where it's, it's become a way for these users who are not uh, developers. So like these sergeants or <coughs> captains go in there and use this and upload it into this recognition and build out this database without having much uh, programming names. They don't have to do all those pieces that were great out now. Because before you had to have all these machine learning and AI specialists come in there and build all these models out. And now here, you just use like kind of the basic feature of like matching person to person or objects like bald hair or whatever. And it could tie into that and they can, they can make matches and then they would have a human override to figure out who that was. Go into license plates, you can imagine how that's gonna just take off. And then Amazon Poly again is this turning the text into lifetime speech using um, deep learning. And again, all the deep learning is behind the scenes so you don't have to worry about all those pieces. Now, if you want like recognition, like a, a lot of use cases for this, like become like um, a dermatologist, uh, key guys said, oh yeah, I want to be able to recognize different types of acne, different type of uh, facial issues. So every time you take a picture, it could identify exactly the type A acne or type B, whatever it is, or skin tone, and then be able to diagnose based on what it's seeing and comparing to whatever works for that other skin tone. And it's great. But the idea is recognition doesn't have that deep learning piece in it because it's just male, female, the basics of it. So she, that woman would have to go down to the next level of kind of a deep learning piece, but that's, that's there for them. So they can put that, those pieces in there, build this model. And that's a lot of these big companies are doing, using the, um, the, the models and building out these great uh, the data sets. And then the more data you have, the better uh, accuracy you're gonna have when you have the results and, and bring it back. Does that make sense on all these three? These are the, the high level pieces, taking the AI, the machine learning, all those pieces out of it, making it so that you can just attach it to your uh, your uh, apps, whatever it might be. Or, and well, Dennis, whatever. on the recognition, is that real time or is that post? Do you have to post process images? It's, um, it is post process, but it's, it's very quick. Like I could upload an image and within seconds. And then you saw the machine gun, did you see the dartboard I had? So yeah. there was a, a maker, um, <clears throat> we had a dart, um, a dart gun that was an automatic dart gun. And we set it up to go to the cloud. So it would have to go to the cloud every time, which would be realistic, but, um, and we, we modeled it. So it had a picture of like white, so any, um, I think it was, they had it, so it was shooting at everything, but this one woman who, who created it. And of course, uh, and so <clears throat> it was designed just to shoot at anything, and then if it would recognize her face, it wouldn't shoot. And so it would go to the cloud and literally, so it would build the model ahead of time, and if it didn't know it would just shoot, but it built the model ahead of time, so it would, it was pretty much, you would splash the car, so it flashed this guy, and it would shoot, and then as soon as they flashed this, this woman's face, it was like nothing, and so it was, it, it was pretty much immediate. So go in there, make wow. a call, and run through. So if you build that model ahead of time, then it's pretty much, it's real time within seconds. And you'll see like 
when I do the chat box, it's like as soon as I type in a command, it goes in there back, comes back, and because uh, that's the idea. It's got to be low latency. It's got to feel like it's right, real. Got it. Yeah. Did you say the uh, Folly has an animated talking head? And it does not by default. There's a sample out there that that you can attach to it, and you can do the the facial the movement with the text. Yeah, but it doesn't by default. I'm guessing that probably um, more more to that because they'll have like uh, more voices. They I think they have an open source team that's working on some um, animated characters that you can now um, download and run through. I think there's a blog post on it now because I just saw the first demo. It was pretty cool. Uh, so that's AI. Okay, so we're going to go in the last piece. Uh, I'm probably not boring you guys too much. So this is the last piece. We're going to go into Amazon Lex. And uh, I'm going to show you. We're going to build out a little bit. I'm not going to do, build the whole thing, but I'm going to show you kind of what that intent looks like. And then it's going to be based off of this. And I'll show you. The, the link will be at the end of the slide. Um, but if you go to uh, AWS um, AI Block. I have a link in there, I just want to see if I can. So the AI block has a link to all these. Um, I want to talk about, see if it has. There we go. So I like to show this picture. So, so we're going to uh, build an idea. And so this shows you a picture where the user's talking into uh, Amazon Lex, get traded value for 2012 Honda Civic. So it goes into the Amazon Lex engine, right? It goes in there, and then everything's translated to text. That text goes into these slots. So think about these slots as variables. So that you put a URL in, in there, and you have the you know, username, question mark, and then equals this, and you put those uh, variables in there. Think of these slots as those kind of variables that you're looking for. So when we set it up, we set up the intent is the the trading, so we're going to want to get the trading value for a vehicle, and then it's looking for these certain slots. So it's looking for a year, a make, and a model. And then it goes in there and says, okay, trade it, got that, and then year, 2012, and then each time it goes into Lambda to verify whether it's like valid data or it can go back to the database and say, okay, we don't have any vehicle in 2012, we have everything in 2016 and beyond, or something like that. If somebody puts in 2001, we don't have any vehicles in 2001, so we come back and ask for that another valid year. And then go in and make model and say, okay, great, I got all this up. And then it's, once it's satisfied all those values, and think about the website now, go back and we get all these values for a vehicle. And then once it's all satisfied, it goes back into Lambda for one final say, and Lambda says, okay, and each time all these values are being passed back and forth between Lambda and, and Lex. And Lambda says, okay, got all these values, and it makes one final API call to wherever it is. In this case, it could go to uh, Kelly Lewis API. And then it'll come back and then say, um, <clears throat> It'll come back and give you the true value based on all the information. So everything's satisfied, and then she'll come back and say, so Lambda will say, yep, everything's satisfied, gone back to the API, and then this text comes back from Lambda with this text, comes back to Amazon Lex, and Lex uses Holly and spits out the exact, the current Kelly Blue Book trading value for 2012 Honda, and then it spits it back out to the user. Now, if that was a text interaction between the user and Lex, that it would just come back and then as a text instead of going through poly, but it'd be the same exact thing. So you'd say, "What is my, uh, what is my vehicle worth, or whatever it is?" And so that's kind of the con this is the whole flow. This is the concept, and this is this does all that work of translating that thing and, and translating those um, that conversation. I'll show you what it look, might look like, how it's um, it's used when somebody says something and it's not expecting it, or yeah, there's some kind of value that's really weird. But um, and I'll show you that. <coughs> So again, if you can't remember what it is, you can just do Lex, and then it'll pop up in there in the um, dashboard. And then I created one that just says Echo Me, and I'll show you real quick what that looks like. It's built. And um, so the website gives you, this is the Amazon Lex console. You build it, and then all we have is um, a sample utterance, it's called Echo, and one slot. And everything goes in the slot, and basically Lambda says, Anything I say echo and anything after that, just spit it back to me. And that's all it's going to do. So I just say echo, uh, so I can type, echo, repeat after me, and then repeat after me. So, all it, so 
really fast, it went back to Lambda, said Lambda, okay, I got the text, and then split it back. And then same thing, if I use text or voice, let's see if I have the app on here. Later, I'm not gonna install it. Um, okay, we'll have to go back and iterate over here. It's a conversational box. You guys can't see that from there. Um, oh, you'll be able to hear it. So the echo thing, I'll show you. See if you can hear this. <coughs> Echo, repeat after me. Repeat after me. Echo, the quick brown fox turned over the lazy dog. And then it should go back in and repeat that. I stopped it there. Echo, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So that's the, the voice is a little bit robotic, but you see that that went back into um, the whole process went back into Lambda and then processed all those words and then spit it back through poly to the voice. And that was fairly simple. So, and again, in the Lambda function, you have that control, right? That anything you want to do with it, you can say, he said fox, and then what does the fox say? You know, I mean, it could do anything once it has that text and it could pull in the API, it could respond back to the user, um, anything you want it to do. So you have this interface. <clears throat> so if you go back to, to uh, vehicle value. This is the one that I'll talk about real quick. Is so. Remember we talked about slots. So the, if you've ever built an Alexa skill, they have these special slots that are looking for certain values, like let's say European city. So it knows that it's looking for a European city. If it doesn't match, kicks it back out. So it's kind of important. A lot of things like dates, and a lot of things you might take for granted. Like if you say, um, I want to rent a car tomorrow. Tomorrow, it has to know what tomorrow is. So. Behind the scenes, it has this date value. It says tomorrow is, what is tomorrow? tomorrow's Tuesday. Tomorrow's Tuesday the 1st, right? So it knows tomorrow's August 1st. You don't have to say Tuesday, August 1st, rent me a car. You just say, rent a car for tomorrow. And then it'll say, it knows tomorrow is fine. And it'll say, okay, what type of car? Because it knows by that, remember we talked about the slide. <clears throat> this is, remember those, those, those slots we talked about? Once it has a required slot, it moves on to the next thing. So as I say, I want to, um, in this case, I want a vehicle year. It says, okay, great. That's a valve here. Goes to the next question we know is going to be vehicle make. And then the question will be what make is your vehicle year, which is a little whatever, repeat whatever year I said. And then if I say one, they're like, wait, it doesn't make sense. It'll repeat back again. You can have a prompt different things you want. So you can say, what did you say? Say that again? I mean, you can say whatever it wants if it doesn't understand what it's looking for. And again, it goes to Lambda, and Lambda says, you're good. This is it? No. Yes, no. And then it can go back and land, and then Lex can actually say, I want to ask it a different way or a different question. <clears throat> so then once it's satisfied with all these requirements, then it'll say, okay, it'll go through that value. So here, I'll give you an example. So I could say, um, and then this utterances, these, these build up kind of man, uh, organically. So like, so what all, all the ways that somebody would say, what are my vehicle value? Like, what is my vehicle make word? Uh, what get trading value for me, get trading value for my vehicle year making model, all these different utterances that somebody might want to um, request a vehicle value. So in this case, um, I just put in all these different ones because everybody seems to be different. Then you could grow up with this. It's like um, Amazon Lex will create a, a missed utterances in monitoring. So if you, if you have a bunch of users and they're asking for a vehicle value in some different way, then it'll track that in monitoring and we'll be able to see exactly what those people are trying to do and try to get your vehicle, and you can add those utterances in. So kind of a building of this model, per se. So these are kind of built out of what people have used, and then so in this case, I'm gonna say the easiest to type for me would just say, um, what is my uh, 2012 Honda worth? And see, it should match the last one, and then it'll say, what model is your 2012? Because now here, so it knows the year and make, and what's the next step? It's going to ask for a model. And if I say Civic, and now everything's been satisfied. And see how fast it was? It just went in there, landed, talked to the database, went back. It's a fake database, by the way. It's not going to anything. It just has a bunch of static value for now. But the idea is to go back and do a naked API call. And then it just comes back and says, do you want me to call a fake API? So the idea is it goes back. And let's do one weird one, like uh, let's say, um, uh, what is my Honda worth? And say, what year is your Honda? Because it's like, wait, it's figured out what, because of all these utterances, it says, okay, what year is your Honda? Um, oh, thanks for asking. I said 2012. 
and then what model is your 2012? So, so it kind of went backwards and said, wait, I didn't know which, what year it was, but you said uh, it already matched the make, and then if I say it should fail, and say we don't know how, we don't have a blah, blah, blah vehicle model in our 2012 Honda. So the idea is like, it's smart enough to go back and forth with all this data, like, so imagine like, you're doing all these web requests and say, you know, somebody drops down. And in this case, Kelly Wilk has the drop down, right? So you're not, you can't pick anything else. But the time savings here alone is like, was quite dramatic. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm create a chatbot, but it might not actually do anything, uh, benefit your users, right? Like, oh, I got a chatbot, let's do it, let's make some money. And really not the case, but like in this one, if you go to Kelly Blue Book and you say, oh, okay, I got a 2012 Honda Civic EX4, right? let's go. And I'm going to talk to the app, and then you go select all the, all the features in it. And I'll beat you 10 times out of 10 because I can just voice command and it'll run through and, and get that information quickly to me. And there's some things that are built in, like maybe the app already has your location, right? Because the Kelly Blue Book is real time, so it knows exactly. Chicago Honda Civics are not the same as, as San Francisco's uh, Honda Civics. So it knows where you are and kind of pick up that information. So this is the idea of like building out utterances to slot values. Think of those as, as values, as uh, objects you're passing in. And you can um, set those values and then verify those, each one of those, make them required or not. Like uh, if you want to say vehicle mileage, maybe not required, but, and then we'll just default to whatever 2012 Honda might be, which is X amount of miles that determine. And then, um, and then it prompts lambda functions for, for um, doing the final fulfillment. And then you can create all these different values that you can say like, um, you can have to try three times, and every time I say like, it asks me for make, and I say blah, and then blah again, blah again, I say, you're done. We're done with you. And it could, it could just say, after three tries, we're done. So it kind of acts like a real person. So imagine all these like use cases where you can um, interact with a, with a service and ask it questions, and it can kind of read off of what you're trying to say, and then kind of make predictions on uh, what the next steps are. And it goes pretty fast. If you think um, when we did, let's do the vehicle value on voice real quick and see, just to demonstrate the, how fast it goes through. What is my 2012 Honda worth? What model is your 2012 Honda? Civic. Your 2012 Honda Civic vehicle has been validated and ready for trade-in. Do you want to make a call with Big API? No. <laughs> so, so the idea, um, I mean, it's a slow because she's type talking. You can have someone talk a little bit faster. and. When you create these bots, you have a choice of creating a, like I said, the female voice, the accent voice, whatever you might want to do. And then that's through. But the nice thing, you have to have a low latency because otherwise you're going to be just like, give me the car and then it's just like, you know, 30 seconds later, come back with the car and it just doesn't make any sense. So the nice thing, as soon as you're ready to type in there, literally it'll come back and it'll call that uh, lambda function and come back to you. And in a lot of cases, you might not even have to use lambda. You can have it just validate on certain values. And, and then move on. So that's really the, the whole idea of the bot. So the three pieces, we create this, uh, let's go back real quick, just to recap um, the vehicle value one. So we created this intent, trade value, that's it. And then we create these set letters as we can start out with two or three, what more common, and then we can go through this monitoring. will tell us some of the missed utterances here. It'll detect. Um, some of the missed ones, and then you can say, oh, wow, I didn't think about that. And then there's a button that just says, add to my utterances. And so you could about, I mean, it could be big if you want, but then you might have some overlaps, so you just gotta be careful. So it's easy to get this built within a few minutes, but then building it out, the whole thing about the, making a true interaction takes a lot of time, trying to figure out exactly what that user's trying to say and do. But the idea is, this is a fully managed service that has all the pieces put together ready for you to build. And then you connect it to your API. So, the one thing, so we have the, um, so we have this vehicle va a value of 10, whoops, and um, then we have the utterances, and then the slots. And the slots, remember this is the vehicle, so this number thing, if I didn't have the number value, it would get all kind of messed up and say, oh, 2,000, may end up spelling out 2,212 or whatever, and get kind of messed up, so you have to know some of these built-in values and take advantage of any of those values that you might see, like postal address is another one. So it starts saying like 33313, and they instead of type, you know, making a whole word 333, it wouldn't really work. So it knows these numbers are always going to come through and pass in the lambda that has a number. So think about like phone numbers, not, it's never going to pass in like 
206 or 707, like S-E-V-E-A. It'll always pass in that number so you have an idea and you can validate that much easier. So it kind of takes that whole validation step out of it. And then you can prompt it and say, okay, what year is your vehicle? What's the next step? What? And you can have it say anything you want really here and then it repeats anything inside this bracket will repeat whatever value it's already captured. And again, as soon as it captures value, it says, great, I'm holding on to this vehicle value. This bracket, this vehicle year, this vehicle make, it's already passed in back and forth to Lambda. So they all know exactly what's going on and they can track session. So I can say, I know Lambda knows exactly who this user is and they can track it. And technically you should be able to like go into the next device and interact with this bot in the same session that you're already in because it already knows who you are if you want to track it by a user. So those are kind of the big pieces. So then once we have this built, hit this build and we can publish, we can go through different channels, we can go through um, Twilio, Slack, um, and Facebook, Facebook um, Messenger. And I think I have, let's, uh, let me bring this up real quick. I don't already have it. I have uh, integrated with, uh, with, um, with Twilio. And I'll show you how that um, integration works because it's pretty seamless. If you think about take out the whole mobile app, we've just created this chat, this API, right? We haven't even built an app because we haven't decided what we're going to do. We're going to go mobile web, we're going to go cross platform, whatever it might be. But we now we can just take this chatbot, connect it to our API because we made this really great weather API, or this vehicle in this case, let's stick with the theme. Create this bot, and now we can integrate with Facebook, we can integrate with Twilio, and we can have this whole interaction. We don't even have a mobile app yet. So you know, maybe that could be tied into some other API service, or you can make money off this chatbot, or it could be just a front for testing, whatever it might be. Um, so I was going to try a quick time here. And then so... Just a quick question. So yeah. if I want, uh, you showed us the, the chat stream, and you were doing something on the voice. How are you sending voice to, uh, to this server? So the voice is just the built-in microphone of the, of the app. It just uses voice, and it just pulls in. So you integrate the SDK with the uh, Amazon Max. And then you say, I want to set voice, and then it just says, okay, you integrate with that with the microphone, and then hold up and say, you know, launch um, the microphone, and then uh, give it permission so the user can give permission to the microphone. And then any voice you do, it translates that, streams it back into the into Amazon Alexa. So it knows when to stop and then to send that voice yeah. to Yeah, like there's no, if there's a slow pause or something like that, yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of tweaking you can do there, like if you want to be able to like, um, if I wanted to stand up here and say, every time I said, um, it would react and say, oh no, back up and, and stream it. So it usually does the short little segments of it and then send it, you'll see the little icon moving, say, okay, now it's thinking and then I'll spit back that information. Um, so the question is, um, can I call my own APIs through Lambda if I need to get some other data out from my own APIs? You want to call? So let's say once, once I do a problem, once I have the voice stream, Mm -hmm. And Alexa goes through the uh, this service goes through the stars and now calls that lambda function. Yeah. Within the lambda function, I can call my own API. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now right now you have to use lambda, but uh, it's great because it's integrated. But lambda, remember, lambda can go anything. So you can say like we had a uh, hackathon. We did uh, the food API. Uh, what's the big deal? So we had the food uh, API. So somebody just says find the nearest uh, spaghetti house and it translates Spaghetti House, and then behind the scenes, it went to Lambda. Lambda queried the Yelp API and came back with the results of it if I went to Yelp and said, look for Spaghetti House. So the idea is already out, make sure you're using somebody else's API and just putting a front end to it. So that's what's kind of nice is that, yeah, you can call any function or any um, search you want outside of Lambda. But as long as it goes to Lambda first, in that case. Um, okay. So let me see, I got a project, uh, let's see, can't remember that, oh here. So this is a Twilio number I have, 213-699, and let's see if it works, if I have it integrated, what is my car worth? And this is the same exact thing we just did in the web, same exact thing on the voice, so what is my car worth? Of course I can't do voice. Um, So that's going through Twilio. So I, you know, paid a dollar a month for this for this number, and then in the integration, all I did was said, okay, create this this bot, and then I went to Twilio, gave me this endpoint, and then tells me how to, you know, copy there, and then I create this um, 
this auth token and, and SID from Twilio, and that's it. And I give out my number, and then it becomes a chatbot with with text. So then you know, we haven't created a mobile app yet. So think about the kind of things you can do with that, and and let uh, let Twilio scale it, and it comes back in and, and does all the information, so you can create this without even having an app or a website up and running. Okay, it connects in there. And then on the fly, the nice thing is I can go to the Lambda function right now, tweak the Lambda function and do whatever. Like instead of coming back and say, your vehicle value is set up, I can just say, go away. On the fly, not have to release anything. I don't change numbers, I don't change endpoints, APIs. All you're doing is changing that logic behind the scenes. Remember, because we have that API going in the API, well not in this case, API gateway, but Lex talks to Lambda, and then Lambda behind the scenes, all we, we can treat that, we can make a new version of it, we can do whatever, we can test it, we say, okay, let's make this Lambda function of development, start working on it, and meanwhile, everybody's talking to the main production one, it's like, all right, now we're ready, and then just flip it, flip a switch, and then all of a sudden, now it's calling the new production one, so without any ch interface changes at all. And again, then when you go to the, oh, and then the last piece would be integrating with, with Mobile Hub. So, go back into here, so we have our app, right? We've built all the, the, um, the detail behind the scenes, and then we just go into conversational box, and then we're gonna import. So here you can create the make appointment, or whatever, if you wanna play with it, and, and do that route. But I have echo me, and then I'm gonna do, I think vehicle value was the one that I wanna do, which it didn't take both. Well, and then you can edit it if you want, but I don't wanna edit that. Um, and then I wanna create, I wanna import the, I think that's a little bug right there because I selected both that should have appropriate. So this seems pretty simple. Like, okay, what, what value is this doing, uh, giving me? So when I'm doing this is I've already created this, these, these bots, and what it's doing is it's making that best practice of tying in those users that are already created for a uh, username and password for Cognito, and then tying this in with um, the sample app. So it's gonna put in that bubble piece, right, with a chat and a chat field in there and send. It'll put in the the Amazon Lex uh, SDK, it'll put in the permissions for the microphone, so then you can start interacting with it with text or voice right away. So now, once I've integrated that, that's all it's doing is I hit integrate, and again, it'll be able to this, um, this app, launch it, and then instead of those, um, oh, let's put in there, and instead we saw this, uh, that's the one. and then in here, we would just see the other piece where it would um, show the bots here and we can interact with any of those bots, the vehicle value or the echo, like we did, which is voice or text. And that's it. So that's within that, so that creates the whole end end. So I created this, this chat bot, integrated with my mobile app, and then I can run with it. Now I don't have to change this. This is already released on the App Store, not like this, but let's say this is already released in the App Store and we want to change that back in with the, with the API or the chat bot, we can do so without making any uh, changes for the user. Seamless. So that's it. So we built, we talked about the serverless piece, we talked about building a mobile app, integrating that with a fully functional, and then if you want, we didn't really uh, analyze this, but this is a piece where you take the, the different features and enable those into your app to make, clarify your app. And then we went in to talk about the AI piece, um, and then built the chatbot, which showed you kind of those three pieces, right? The intents um, and the, uh, the slots and the utterances, so those three pieces and then build it out, kind of demo that, and then we were able to integrate with like Twilio, and then we could put it in our mobile app. So kind of put the whole pieces in. That's where we kind of come in, is try to integrate with some of these features that might be a little more difficult, like say, if you wanted to take this Amazon Lex chatbot in your own app, uh, you'd have to go get the SDK, you know, pull this thing in, it's, it's doable, but the nice thing is they'll come in here and just make a couple clicks and import that, and be done. And that's it. Cool. Thanks, Alex. And again, I'll be here. If anybody has any specific questions, and um, I'll go check. If you have time, do you mind showing us the recognition and how that works? Oh, or yeah. Then, I don't have a demo, but I can show you the console is out here. Yeah, we oh. sorry. And how do you even charge for it? Is it based on per call basis, or? Uh, yeah, I don't have the specifics on that, so let's take a look at it. Um, so it's recognition with K. And the, the, the main site has a cool uh, demo. So we can call, I think we can upload images so here. So um, this kind of gives you an idea. So we upload a picture of a skateboard and it comes in and says, okay, it's 99% skateboard, sport. Again, remember these are the predefined things that, rec that recognition uses. And then, um, and then you can upload it right now if you want to do it. You can upload an image. 
Uh, I think an image of me, and then it could give me the facial like the person smiling, he's wearing glasses, he's bald, he's 87 years old, whatever it is. Um, and then and then I could pull out pictures of, of different things to so demo the different things we're going to identify um, images of. I think that's one of the demos here, right? Uh, so here, facial analysis. Here's another one. So here, take a picture of this this female. She's 98%. Looks like a face. Okay, that's good. 100% appears to be female. Okay. And then gives an approximate age, and then smiling, and then you can set this. Uh, these are kind of the, the values. So you can imagine taking this into like, anything like, let's say, uh, analyzing any photo that has like glasses in there. Maybe you're a sunglass hut or something, or whatever it might be. And then if anything that has a picture of sunglasses, then you can analyze the glasses more. Or, you know, fifty percent of the people that are driving an old car are wearing glasses. Whatever. Um, so you can use that as analytics. And again, it's this they're predefined on somebody smiling, appears to be happy, there's a sad one, I think I'm not wearing glasses. Um, and then I think there's some other some other details. And then I'll show you the request response. And then this one is um, this one analyzes the different faces, it appears like uh, and it can break it down by the, the two different squares, it'll give you details about which face it's picking out. And then this is what this is did is when in response, if you can see this. It'll give you all these locations, and that's where they build this box out. So let's say it identified this as a female, and then here's the box around that it identified the face. So you could actually take this and render it back into an image if you wanted to, which is a nice use case for one of our transcoder services, which would be cool. Like take this whole bundle response and then make a video out of it. So that if you've seen it, right, where it's following along and it's reading the license plates as it goes along and um, recognize it. So, and again, I could throw a video in here or. Um, a, uh, an image. So here's a celebrity. Um, a celebrity? <laughs> <laughs> he was the richest, yes. richest guy for less than 24 hours or something like that? Yeah. Uh, and then here's some more facial. So this just gives you an uh, example of like, um, so we're looking for this one girl and then it's not, in this one picture, it's not, you know, it doesn't compare really well. So a lot of this is just model building. And a lot of, this is really common like um, with a lot of the new home security uh, services now. There's like two big ones now that um, it recognizes their kids so that you know how like it could trigger and send you a push notification or a text and say, hey, somebody's triggered your front door. Well, now you could actually be smart enough is it knows who your kids are. So if you want to even send you a notification if it's your kid or your stupid dog that's at the front door is trying to get in and you left them out or something. So it'll identify, actually not, I don't know if it identified dog, but the people, it could. And so it'll say, text notification say, hey, Johnny's at the front door. Johnny just entered at 2 p.m. And you got your and you look at the phone. So that's kind of common now is building out these uh, facial recognition so it knows to say, only send me notification if it's not someone in my family. You know, because somebody always is triggering these apps. So it kind of gets a little bit smarter, can build out, and they're using something like facial re uh, recognition for that, building out these models. So they take a picture and you can just train it easily. Like take two or three pictures of their kids, face on, sideways, and then it'll be able to identify who they are with pretty uh, good accuracy. Interesting trivia about that company, Orbius, they went through Techstars Chicago oh. five years ago, and I had an accelerator before they just sold to, to Amazon. Oh. So a company called Orbius. It was about Interesting. six founders, yeah. uh, PhDs, and they lived in a trailer park in Palo Alto. <laughs> and they worked and, uh, right. and developed together. Yeah, so if you don't make a lot of money in your app, just get a bunch of users and then exit strategy, sell it to somebody. Pretty cool story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you an idea. Um, we don't have any demos, but that kind of ties in with that, the Nerf gun piece where it can identify a user and see you whitelist things and, and uh, just throw a bunch of images in there and compare it and, and, and get that, those details out. And then how you can imagine like, how you could get more information out of it if you could provide your own models, like license plates, cars. Uh, Kelly Blue Book can take all their uh, their images of all their vehicles and then I have an app that just takes pictures of this cool Corvette, right? It's like, oh, it'll tell me exactly what year that Corvette <coughs> is, what color it is, what, when it was made, you know, maybe it's black and the actual year it was only made in red and you're like, okay, this doesn't seem to be tying with a custom car and then um, maybe they can advertise and say, hey, a local dealer's offering a 67 Chevy or whatever um, nearby. So you get, you get the idea of like, how you can expand some of this and utilize some of the data that's available now with just some recognition. And so I think we're going to see a lot of different use cases for this. And that was, when was the Orbeez? 
recent within the last year. Orbit's acquisition was a secret. It wasn't publicized. Okay. Well, it was under two years ago. Yeah. Um, and they, they've been around for about six years. Yeah. It's one of many that I've got. I think we should wrap up, okay. and then um, and then you'll hang out for a little bit. Yeah. Any questions? But thank, thank you. you everyone for coming tonight. Um,